their devices. Um, I won't be able to do that. An image of the flag is displayed, and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, and I'll ask the staff to please do a roll call. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. This is Danielle Arthur from Hart. Please say here after your name is called. Committee Chair Kemp. Here. Director Hardin. Here. Director Castor. Here. Director Mechanic. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Director McLean indicated that he would not be present at the meeting. Director Mechanic. I'm here. Director Overman? Here. And uh, Thank you. committee member Shanahan um, has resigned from the board and therefore is no longer on the committee. Thank you. Right. Also, we um, also in attendance, we do have council member Schistler. Okay. And I'd like to ask the Heart General Counsel, Julia Mendel, to read into the record the rules for committee participation. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you for your participation in this virtual meeting. The change of meeting location from in-person at Hart Administrative Office to virtual meeting is pursuant to Executive Order Number 20-69 issued by the Governor of the State of Florida on March 20th, 2020 and has been extended until uh, the end of July and also Section 120-54 Florida Statutes. Due to social distancing, the board room in the eboard administrative office is only accessible for personnel facilitating the meeting. Please keep your device and phones muted when not speaking. Muting the sound on your devices will help to avoid feedback. Please do not enable the video camera on your device and discontinue all personal conversations during the meeting. Please follow along with a copy of the meeting agenda and material sent via email. All presentations will be shared on the screen while presented. Roll call has been taken for attendance and will also be taken for uh, voting. Quorum and voting results will be announced. Please wait to announce your attendance until your name is called during roll call, and please make sure that you are counted as part of voting, otherwise you will be deemed absent at vote. There will be an opportunity for members of the public who have pre-registered with hard staff to provide comments. General counsel will read into the record the public comment participation rules. During the meeting, please wait until the chair asks for comments or questions from committee uh, and board members for each agenda item as the meeting progresses through the agenda. When you want to provide a comment or ask a question, please signal that you want to speak by activating the hand button, which is in the white circle next to your name, on the screen. The hand will turn blue when activated. Staff will read the hands raised in order for the chair to acknowledge, then participant may unmute their device and speak. Please speak your name before comment. Presenters, please note all presentations will be controlled by the HART staff. Ensure that you state your name, title, and the company organization for the record. Please say next slide when needed, and staff will progress through the presentation. Thank you. Has joined the meeting. Thank you. Um, I heard someone else join the meeting. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Thank you for reading the rules. Um, no, I have very little else here. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we'll next go to approval of the minutes. Um, the next agenda item is approval of the Strategic Planning and External Relations Committee minutes from May 18, 2020. You can find on page four of the packet, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Pardon, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. And if we can take a vote, I guess we have to do it by uh, name. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please say yes or no after your name is called Committee Chair Kemp. Yes. Director Hardin. Yes. Director Castor. Yes. Director Mechanic. 
Director Mechanic. Director Overman. Yes. The motion passes four to zero. Okay, thank you. Then we'll move on, I guess, to the um, uh, next, uh, the first of the, um, oh, we have the public comment next, I'm sorry. So is there any um, public comments? Um, uh, Julia, um, Ms. Lindell will read the um, rules into the record or read the rules. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is Julia Mandel. The board welcomes public comments about any issues and concerns and has made provisions to allow for virtual public comment. Public comments offered virtually will be afforded equal consideration as if they were offered in person. Anyone wanting to provide public comment for any HART committee or board meeting should contact Danielle Arthur, board administrator at ArthurD at GoHart.org or at 813-955-2426 with your name and phone number for pre-registration. Comments are due by 5 p.m. the day previous to the meeting. Staff will call on speakers by name in the order in which they've registered. All callers will be muted upon calling and unmuted in the submission order after being recognized by name. Please state your full name, your organization, and address. Up to three minutes are allowed for each speaker, and the speaker will be muted once time is up. Staff, please proceed. Yes, this is Yolanda Jennings from Hart. We have two public comments today. Um, first, we have Mr. Gary Cloyd. Madam okay. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Strategic Planning and External Relations Committee. My name is Gary Cloyd, and this is in response or in reference to 4A and 4D, 4A being the Tampa Streetcar Project Briefing, and 4D, which would be the FY21 Potential Service Modifications and Budget Implications. I wanted to remind the committee that as you listen to these presentations today, that there are several factors that would be involved. Uh, the first one would be manpower. The second one would be cost. The third would be administrative and procurement factors. The fourth would be marketing and promotions. The fifth would be scheduling and frequency. The sixth would be connectivity. And the seventh would be grants. Now, that is a pretty... Uh, comprehensive list, but I wanted to remind the committee that as we go through this process between now and January, that a review of policies and procedures relative to what the committee and as well as the Hart Board of Directors is trying to accomplish, I just wanted to make sure some people were aware of that because manpower could be the difference and grants could be the difference. Uh, depending on what you're trying to do and how we're trying to move people in the Hillsborough County area. And that concludes my public comment. Okay, thank you. And we have a second person signed up? Yes, ma'am. We have Ms. Dana Larezas. Let me unmute her. Yes. Gary Cloyd. Uh, Ms. Lazarus. Has left the meeting. Oh, I'm, I'm here. This is Dana. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Okay. Um, hello. My name is Dana Lazarus. Um, I'm a homeowner in East Tampa um, at the corner of 26th uh, Street and um, former USF student. And if I were representing an organization, I'd be representing um, Transit Now Tampa Bay. We just uh, are huge supporters of transit, public transit in the Tampa Bay area as well as student advocates for progressive USF organization, um, um, uh, Masters of Urban and Regional Planning students, which I just graduated. So my comment is actually, uh, well, first of all, I want to say thank you to whoever posted about this meeting and public comment, how to sign up for public comment on the Transit Now Tampa Bay page. I think that was a really effective way to get the word out about public meetings like this, that's that's how I found out about this meeting and, and signed up. So whoever posted that, thank you so much. I think Facebook is a 
amazing tool uh, for just regular citizen outreach. Um, so I wanted to talk about the Mosey redevelopment and tying that into the BRT uh, proposal on um, Fowler. Um, I didn't get to see the agenda, so I'm just kind of making some general comments today for your consideration. Um, so the Mosey property is county owned and um, there is an RFP currently um, out right now to redevelop that area. Um, it's millions and millions of dollars of, of public investment money and um, we need to make sure that we maximize the public value of that, um, that space. And so. Uh, I think it may have been Pat Kemp or someone who brought up the idea of making this a transit-oriented development space. And I just want to voice my full um, support of that concept of making this a space that's high density, very well-protected, affordable housing, and, you know, have a transit hub in that space as well um, if it makes sense to do so. And... Um, yeah, that would be just a fantastic opportunity. I mean, especially at the Mosey uh, property there, if we can keep our, our Museum of Science and Industry, which I am fully in support of because growing up in this, this, this area, I went to that museum all the time and it really positively affected my development as a child. Um, it would be just fantastic to have public transit there, especially from USF. Um, one thing I want to mention is as a former USF student, um, who studied transportation, um, I spoke to a lot of international students. USF has one of the highest um, number of international students that go to uh, an American college, and they come here and they don't own a vehicle, and they don't know how to get around, and they are looking for public transit in that area. So that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good comments. I just remember about the foreign students that I took in over time and how there was no transportation for them in Tampa, um, or too little. Um, so is there another, um, any other comments? No, ma'am. That concludes the comments for public. That's great. Um, and so this concludes the public input section of the meeting. Um, then the Hart General Council will read the closing Thanks for statement. using WebEx. Visit our website at www.webex.com. Uh, this is Julia Mandel. I, I hope I'm still on. Uh, thank you all for sharing your comments and participating in the virtual meeting. Please continue to listen and view the meeting on the Hart YouTube channel at www.youtube.com backslash user backslash Hart Transit. Please note that the public comment uh, part of this agenda has ended, and a brief prompt will play, but no meeting participants will be disconnected, so please disregard the prompt. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, and maybe I'll be able to connect up shortly, and it looks like it. Um, the next agenda item is uh, presentation, and for that we have Envision, the Tampa Streetcar Project Briefing, Mr. Steve Shoecraft. From HDR, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. This is Steve Shoecraft with HDR. Hello, I'm sorry. Yes, I can hear you. I don't okay. Know um, <laughs> have you left the meeting? Be, you will be pulling up the presentation, correct? Adam Horton. Has joined the meeting. Yes, Mr. Shoecraft. This is Danielle, and I will be controlling your presentation. Just say next slide uh, when you're ready to proceed. Thank you. Okay, I can't see anything on my screen yet, so I don't know if I'm missing something. Great, I can see it now. You can go to the next slide to start. Um, the purpose of this briefing is to uh, provide a quick overview and status update for the project. Uh, to talk a bit about the governance and financial plan assumptions that we've been developing in consultation with HART over the last couple of years and talk about the process for completion of the ratings request to FTA. Um, as you all know and as we've talked about in previous presentations, we are we entered the small starts project development um, process with FTA in June of 2018, so we're two years into that effort. 
there's a sequence of events that you go through, and I think in, in Jeff Booth's presentation later, we'll talk about that in more detail, but there's a series of steps you go through over the course of several years that lead to the grant agreement being approved by FTA um, to fund project construction. And we are midway through that process now, so we're working toward a 2020 timeframe for the grant agreement, and we're up to the point now where we're ready to submit for um, our ratings request to rate the project um, and eventually include it in the federal budget for funding in the 2022 timeframe. And I'll talk a little bit more about how that process works as we get further into the presentation. But it's important um, to keep in mind that what this step does in the process, the rating submittal, it keeps us, uh, keeps our place in the pipeline of projects that are being considered for federal funding. Um, it um, helps us move through that queue instead of it taking us out of sequence. Um, and there's potential both uh, new projects generated from this region and across the state and around the country that um, could make this process more competitive over time. So we're trying to maintain momentum as we move toward this, this submittal, additional work that we'll do over the next couple years to proceed toward the grant agreement, um, the final execution of the grant agreement in a year and a half to two years. Next slide. Uh, you can go straight through to the next slide. I'm going to provide some background on the project um, and then do a quick brief on, uh, on the current. Um, the, so the status of the project, we're in the wrap-up of the early phases of project development. So as I mentioned, we've been accepted in FTA Small Starts Project Development. That FTA coordination has been ongoing for the last two years um, with the city and with HART and with our other partners. Um, the preferred extension alternative has been selected. We've um, been in detailed coordination with related projects. Um, Pat Camp has left the meeting. The arterial BRT project, the regional rapid transit project, the heights mobility work that FTA has been doing that influences conditions along the guideway. Um, we've been closely coordinating through the, this last two years with all of those efforts. Um, the NEPA 106 environmental cultural review process is underway. We've submitted documents to FTA that they are reviewing. Um, and the city has been working with HART to develop the 30% design and engineering scope of services that would move us into more detailed um, engineering of the specific improvement projects along the existing alignment and along the extension. What we're heading toward now is the next key milestone, and that's been, uh, we expect that milestone to be announced as August 21st when we submit ratings information on the project. And as I mentioned, Jeff's presentation is organized to talk more specifically about the ratings um, information that's requested and how that leads toward the full funding grant agreement under the Capital Improvement Grant Program at FTA. Um, but what, what the rating submittal includes now is um, financial information for the project, um, ridership information, which feeds into some of the other measures, uh, and an evaluation of land use and economic development conditions uh, planned and uh, existing and planned conditions along the corridor. So we've been working with the city and with HART to pull that information together to prepare for the submittal. And one of the things that we need with that submittal is endorsement letters from HART and the city, DOT, and other uh, other partners and other stakeholders in the project. Next slide, please. You can go to the next one. So as we've talked about before, and I'll go through these slides pretty quickly, is the streetcar project is intended to be um, a, tra a core transportation solution that stitches together downtown and downtown adjacent neighborhoods and links to um, regional projects that serve the city of Tampa, Hillsborough County, and further across the region. Next slide. The current project development effort has been funded by the city of Tampa and DOT, and we've been working closely with HART through that process of uh, coordinating with FT, moving into the project development process, coordinating with FTA, and developing the proposal for the proposed modernization and extension improvements. Next slide. 
Uh, you all know the context better than anyone, so I won't go too deep into this one, but along the existing alignment and the extension we've got in the pipeline um, and, and in the ground some portion of $6 billion in total private investment that's going to significantly increase um, density and intensity along the corridor, um, and which translates into transit supportiveness. Um, and also demand for a service like streetcar to provide connections across the broad footprint of downtown. Next slide. We've seen oh, before um, the pandemic, we've seen what happens when you provide um, higher levels of service, free service, and greater frequencies of service along the existing, just the existing system, which doesn't penetrate into the core of downtown and further north as we're proposing as part of the extension. So what we saw with the project, uh, the streetcar system over the last, this is this steps us back a little bit, but this pulls the first year of the grant. We saw a significant uptick in ridership um, on the existing vehicles with some of the existing accessibility challenges of the network across that the whole early years before the pandemic hit, early months, I'm sorry, before the pandemic hit. And what we saw too is, which is important to, to remember, we didn't just see early months of improvement, we saw a sustained improvement over the course of that increased service and free fare. So we saw people begin to adopt it and that, and that level of use of the system stayed steady and even slightly increased um, before the pandemic hit. Next slide. We've had significant public engagement since the beginning of the project. Uh, five large-scale, well-attended public workshops to work through the early feasibility steps in the project uh, development steps of the effort. We've had extension, extensive stakeholder outreach, including presentations and briefings and small group meetings with stakeholders across the project. We've had, um, I, don't know that, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but many dozens of such meetings over the course of the last couple years. Um, and we've coordinated closely with related projects. You can go to the next slide. We've been in detailed conversations regarding the, uh, you can go to the next slide, I'm sorry. Detailed coordination at the Heights Mobility, Heights Mobility Study and the Heart Arterial BRT Project, as well as the Regional Rapid Transit Project. Um, we've gone so far in that exercise that we're looking at specific design strategies to share the guideway, streetcar guideway with the Arterial BRT service, uh, as well as share the stops. So the stops can be designed to serve local buses, BRT buses, as well as streetcar. Uh, and we've developed designs that support that in other communities, so we have pretty good models to show how that works. Next slide, please. Um, so again, not to be repetitive, and I know that many of you have seen this presentation before, or parts of the presentation, but we're talking about a, a, a service that provides a one-seat trip from Ybor City through the Channel District, Water Street, the core of downtown Tampa, north to North Franklin, and up into Tampa Heights. So a uh, full day frequent service, high capacity vehicles, stops that allow for level boarding, so to um, minimize any challenges for accessibility to the vehicles. Um, we're looking at maximizing the potential for exclusive guideway operations so that most of the extension would not operate in mixed traffic. Also avoiding impacts on parking, um, minimizing impacts on roadway capacity, avoiding significant impacts on sidewalks uh, and private property, and avoiding impacts on cultural and archaeological resources. Next slide. So the project is defined in two parts. There's a modernization and the extension. So we're looking at modernizing the existing system to allow for modern streetcar vehicle operations and then extending along the Florida and Tampa pair from the core of downtown north to Palm Avenue. Next slide. We went through a detailed evaluation of the extension potential, so that looking at specific roadway corridors, but also operations within roadway corridors and within existing rights of way. Um, we have mostly exclusive guideway operations along the extension, except for the portion from approximately Highland north to Palm Avenue on Florida, where it's relatively narrow. We're also designing, next slide, please. We're 
this shows, and, and um, we can talk about this in more detail if you have questions, but it's generally running on the left-hand side of the road with stops that would be in the parking lane outside of the guideway. Um, on the Florida Avenue section, that's narrow, so it's, it's highlighted as section two here. We shift to the right-hand side of the street, and those stops will be along the sidewalk for those couple locations um, on North Frank near North Franklin and in Tampa Heights. And then on Tampa, we would be running on the left side of the street on Tampa with the island stops similar to the south end of Florida. Next slide. The vehicle technology that we're planning for is modern streetcar vehicles. So these are generally considered low floor vehicles that allow for local boarding. So from the um, platform into the vehicle, there's just a, a modest gap and you can uh, step in, step straight in or wheel um, uh, mobility support uh, for folks with accessibility challenges, bicycles, strollers, um, and other things. And the interior configuration of the vehicles, the ones that are generally on the market now and in operation around the country are highly um, flexible in that design. So we can provide for more space for wheelchairs, mobility devices, and bikes um, as is necessary, and that would be something that would be addressed in the design process. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the stop concepts, if you think about this looking as if you're looking north on Florida Avenue, um, the streetcar would run on the left-hand side of the roadway with the stops in island configurations in the parking lane. Um, and that would allow for the right side stop condition or design concept also allows for buses to operate within that same guideway um, because a local bus only has doors on the right hand side. So the right hand stop um, condition is what we've planned for to allow for the tiered use of the guideway. Next slide, please. The modernization improvements along the existing line include guideway reconstruction in a few locations where the turns are tight. So for example, at the turn from Old Water Street to Channelside Drive, that's a tight turn, and we would have to reconstruct the portion of that turn. Uh, we'd be improving the stations along the existing line, so that would involve taking away the ramp and high block, um, reconstructing the platform so it would be level with the modern vehicles, uh, and then replacing the shelters. The streetcar barn expansion would be required to support the additional vehicles. So we'd have to do some work in the yard for the modify the tracks to uh, do an addition to the existing building and possibly place another row of tracks on the north side of the building for vehicle storage. Um, the existing traction power, the, um, the existing substations and the basic power system can be converted relatively easily to support modern streetcar operations, but we'd be looking at changing out the guide wire itself um, to support the, um, the new vehicles. Next slide, please. So here we get to the kind of meat of the discussion. Um, we've done a series of cost estimates for the project over the last couple of years. The last update uh, based on the current level of design is a $210 million total project that includes modernization costs, extension costs, and new vehicles. Um, and then when that gets escalated to the year of expenditure, which is what FTA requires of us, it's a $237 million total project. So when FTA sees the project, they see the $237 million number as the primary number that they're looking for us to show how we're gonna pay for that. Next slide, please. So we've developed um, the, the, an initial rough cut at the funding, and this would be the um, what would be presented in the draft financial plan that would be submitted with the ratings package in August. This includes um, getting close to maxing out the amount of funding available under the small starch program of FTA. So that's $99.9 million from the, from the federal source and then $137.8 million would be needed, um, would need local funding sources to cover. Um, the FDOT New Starts program can support half of that non-federal share, so that's FDOT funding at around $69 million or about 30% of the total project, and then the remaining um, to be split between Hart and the city using 
the surtax funding. So we recognize, and this is an important part of the discussion, we recognize that um, there's some remaining questions about the availability of the surtax funding to support the project, both capital costs and operating costs. Um, but that's the source that we have available now to build the financial plan around. We can submit the financial plan with that source indicated. Um, FTA understands that there's been a challenge to that source and that we may have to find other source of funding to support the project. But currently, uh, in our discussions with FTA, um, that would be the plan to submit showing the surtax as the, as the local match. Um, and then adjust as, as would be required if there's a Supreme Court favorable or unfavorable decision, adjust the plan uh, based on that. But we believe it's the best path forward to plan for submittal in August based on that source and then make adjustments afterwards if we need to. And that keeps us kind of in the queue um, as we move through the rest of the project development process toward the full funding grant agreement. Uh, next slide. Just a quick report about the funding that's been identified for the project through the surtax. So the, um, the, each agency, the city and HART, have submitted plans to fund uh, both the, the streetcar extension modernization. The phase three numbers are the design cost to advance the project through the design process or a portion of the design process, and then the streetcar extension, which would be a future phase of the project looking to go north or west, has also been identified in the first year of funding for the surtax dollars. So this is just a, a side note to indicate that each agency has taken specific action to identify um, some, of the, some of the early costs for the project in their IOC plans. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So a couple of the things that are important that some of the, the two, some of the primary questions that FTA will have of us is, um, can you pay for the project and do you have the right tools and resources in place to deliver the project? Um, so they have, there's an oversight role that FTA plays as we move into the next phase of the project. They actually, um, it's called a PMOC, but there's a project management oversight consultant who would start to work with the city and heart as they develop the next um, the next phase of the project, which involves preparation of a series of readiness documents in advance of getting the full funding grant agreement in place. Um, the existing interlocal agreements, which define the governance structure for the existing system, would need to be updated to clearly identify roles and responsibilities from design and construction to project operations, asset ownership, financial management, um, and long-term maintenance. We've had a series of meetings with, the city has had a series of meetings with HART staff to start to identify the elements of the existing agreements that need to be revised. Um, and that process would continue over the next year and a half until we get ready for the full funding grant agreement. Next slide. So this rolls up the existing structure that requires some level of clarification, but on the past phases of the project, the initial phase and then the third of a mile extension to uh, the Fort Brook Garage, um, the city and heart have played um, an evolving set of roles on those two projects. In the first project, the city led design construction management or the modest extension uh, Hart led that through a design build with the city as a partner. Uh, they've been able to work out a uh, good agreement regarding review and oversight of designs, um, of operations planning, financial management of the project over time. Uh, and we'd be working with, city will be working with Hart over the next year and a half to clarify those, um, to specify in, in high level of detail exactly how the extension and modernization will roll out and what roles everyone will play. So we're still looking at a tri-party agreement with Tampa Historic Streetcar Inc. playing, uh, continuing to play an oversight role and maintaining kind of the communities and stakeholders' voice in the project as the city and heart deliver um, the construction, own and maintain the facilities, uh, and manage operations and finances. Next slide, please. 
So the schedule, and I'm coming to the end, I think this is my last or second to last slide. Um, we're in this, in the, the first three of these from 2020, spring 2020, uh, to 2022, this is the second half of the project development phase of the project. So we're um, moving into design and engineering procurement um, to jump into more detailed design of the project, preparing for the small starts rating submittal in August, beginning 30% design, and then developing the next step um, in the project development effort before full funding grant agreement, um, putting together all the pieces required um, to satisfy FTA's questions about finance, governance, response roles and responsibilities through uh, project construction um, the, and, and starter sorts. Next slide. So again, just to quickly highlight the, the step in the process, the red text is what we're focused on, is the getting the endorsement so we could submit the rating its information in late August. Um, the August deadline, just for quick clarification, FTA has not announced the August 21st deadline yet. We're anticipating that soon. Um, but that's, that was the deadline that they used last year. So if they follow what they did last year, that's what we would expect. So that there's a chance that could um, be pushed back a bit, but we're working toward an August 21st date to get the rating submittal in place. And again, you know, this is one of the cases where um, we always want to reinforce the fact that the FTA New Start Small Starts Grant Capital Improvement Grant Program is a multi-year process. It's not a single submittal and an approval and then you deliver the project. There's multi-steps in the process that we need to take. So we've been in those early phases of coordination with FTA. Um, the rating submittal happens about midway through that effort and then we move into more uh, detailed design, project management, safety security planning, um, and other what we call the gen in general the readiness documents. We prepare those and review those with FTA as we get ready for the full funding grant agreement that could happen in 2022. And I believe that's my last slide. Great. Great. Thank you for your presentation. And I'll just um, ask right now, are there any um, comments or questions? Uh, I, this is Dave Mechanic. I have a couple of questions. Sure. Go ahead. Um, Steve, uh, I, I probably can guess the answer, but um, and I think I've asked you this in earlier presentations, but without the surtax, um, you mentioned that you'd have to look for other sources, funding sources. I mean, have you identified any others that would be in the ballpark to finance this project, or? No, Dave, I think that's the, that's the big question, and, and I think you have asked that um, in previous presentations, and I think that's a challenge that the region faces now, is finding another okay. source to be able to access the federal dollars. Um, one potential source is the money that's already been collected, and so if it's possible that that would be, could be distributed at the same percents and for the same purposes, that would support the capital portion of the project, and then we'd be looking at longer-term um, sources of funding for operating. Okay. Okay. Um, and one one other question: um, the the slide where you showed three um, uh, potential uh, manufacturers of street cars. Is that is is that does that represent what you are recommending as the final list of choices, or would the design and engineering include looking at other options for the streetcar? Yeah, that's a great question. So these are these are three of the car builders with um, that have recently delivered vehicles for systems around the United States. So that partially that means that they're um, by America compliant sources of vehicles for the project. So we have to meet federal rules for, for purchase. Um, and these are three of the types that are available. Um, there are other vehicle manufacturers. Some of them may be able to count um, ways to be American compliant. 
and they will be added to the list of potential um, sources. Excuse me, someone's, if they could mute their mic, <laughs> go ahead. Um, the, but but to, to directly answer your question, yes, that's something that's taken up in the early phases of the design and engineering process. Um, we would identify the candidate vehicles. We would look at the potential for piggybacking on orders from other systems. So that's one of the strategies many cities have used is to um, agree on general specifications with another system and then add to the, the add to that order. So that's another thing that would be explored as part of the early phases of design. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I bring that up because I understand that um, certain systems may require less improvement to the existing track um, configuration that's, than others. So that's that, correct. So that, if you that could be a cost savings uh, option, or you know, potentially. Um, yeah, it, absolutely. And that's one of the one of the things that's specifically called out in the scope of services that the city has been developing with Hart. And that gets us the criteria. When you go down the list of criteria in the left hand column, it says minimum turning radius. That's the number that we'd be looking at. So there's there's systems in Europe and Asia with tighter that, that provide for tighter turning radiuses, which could operate on the existing turns on the system. And so we'd be looking at that as a possibility. Okay. Uh, one, one uh, Madam Chairman, if I could, one last question. Um, have, have you done any um, estimates of the operating cost on the, on the expanded system as compared to our current um, operating budget? Yes, we've looked at the um, cost for the system to be around $6 million in current in 2019 dollars. So if that's escalated, it would be 7 .5 to $8 million a year. We believe that um, we believe that that number can be reduced. And one of the things that needs to be looked at in the early phases of design is a more detailed operations plan to identify how many vehicles Jackie we need Hall from the line. Has left the meeting. Um, we need to identify more carefully how many vehicles we need to provide in a 50-minute headway across the system. And so we were very conservative in the early operational planning that we did, but that's some place where we need to sharpen our pencils to see if we can get by with fewer vehicles in total and then fewer vehicles in service at the same time, and that brings the operational cost down substantially. Okay. All right, thank you. That's all I have. Steve, good, good presentation. Commissioner Kemp, Mayor Are there Caster, any other Caster questions? Questions? Mayor Chair, Caster. This is Mayor Caster. I don't know sure. if you can see my hand up or not. Um, I can't, comments, yeah. A couple of sure. comments that I, I think may answer some of the, um, the, not answer, but provide some insight in some of the, the uh, questions from Mr. Mechanic. First of all, thanks, Steve. That was a great uh, presentation. We appreciate your partnership. And also, we're very grateful for Hart's uh, partnership on this project as well as we, we try to bring it closer and closer to reality here. Uh, the extension and modernization of the streetcars, our flagship fixed guideway project in Tampa and really in all of, of Hillsborough County. And um, this project also, you know, not just for the service it will provide for the, the downtown Tampa and Ebor area, but also it will align with the arterial BRT and the, the regional rapid transit uh, system. It is a, a vital component of the world-class transit system that we've all dreamt of up to this, this date. And then also talking about, to Dave Mechanic's point of uh, the cars along the fixed guideway with the BRT, we can actually have the rubber tire uh, streetcars on this this guided, uh, fixed guideway as well. So as we, in the future, expand on the BRT and the other rapid transit projects, we'll be able to factor that in. We've clearly seen from the presentation and what we all knew is that uh, the, the, the popularity and the necessity of this form of transportation is, uh, is, is there. You look at the ridership and the increase in it has just been dramatic. And that's one of the reasons that the city voters 
uh, overwhelmingly voted for all for transportation was to see the extension and future extensions of this type of transportation uh, happen. And we're all, I think, still holding out a small amount of hope that the all for transportation will uh, uh, be upheld and that the will of the voters will be, will be seen. But in terms of the FTA funding for the fixed guideway, the streetcar extensions at the front of the line in, in Hillsborough, and it's the only project in the county that's been accepted into the FTA project development. And as Steve said, we're preparing to submit the project for the FTA ratings this summer and anticipate um, receiving the federal and state funding in 22, construction 23, 24, and hopefully having uh, ridership in 2025. And this will allow us to move forward on some of the other uh, projects that, that we have identified as well, as Steve said, north and west and, and hopefully east as well from, from this project. But it, it really is an exciting project that will move us forward. And, um, you know, we've spent two years building the momentum on this, and we want to see it uh, continue. And as Steve indicated, we're going to need a letter of support uh, from all of the, the groups listed there in his presentation. And it is uh, my uh, desire to call for a motion after Jeff's presentation that we as a board recommend to the full board or as a committee recommend to the full board that, um, that they write a letter of recommendation to move forward for submittal for the FTA uh, ratings. So thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other uh, comments or questions? Um, any others? No? Okay, well, hearing none, I do have some questions, and thank you for the comments that were made, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I'm just, the, the first thing we're talking about is the phase three. Is that correct? Is this the, what the $237 million would be just for phase three, which, um, is, is that correct, Mr. Shoecraft? Because I know there's a phase yes. three and a pa phase four that I guess... Yes is going to be presented next, but the $237 million is for the Phase 3. Yeah, two, the 237 includes the um, modernization of the existing line to run modern vehicles, the extension of the system to Palm Avenue, um, the new vehicles that, to support that service, and upgrades to the existing maintenance facility to house them and to maintain them. Um, anything so, beyond Palm Avenue, so if it went north or west or east, would be a separate project. Okay, Palm Avenue is the cutoff. So I have, as as many have known, a, a very big concern in terms of um, the tracks. Um, and the concern is this. I do see as a, and I think it's about equity and a lot of other things, um, the CSX project. Um, I would like to see those tracks converted for um, passenger commuter use. Um, and what I'm, my concerns are, and what I've been told many times is, and I'd like to just understand this better, and perhaps you could answer this. So these tracks, as this, this phase, would cross the CSX tracks. Does that mean that we could not ever use the CSX tracks then because of the conflict of two trains uh, for passenger uh, commuter use? No, that shouldn't be a conflict, and there's locations around the country where that, that crossing exists. Um, the, we're going to have to work really carefully both with FRA and FTA and CSX to put the right kinds of controls in place to um, preclude any possible conflicts between vehicles. Um, so, oh, that, that, one of the factors, you know, we have the existing crossing now, which is where Amtrak actually crosses at that location. So you've got passenger trains heavy rail passenger trains and streetcar crossing at one crossing now. Um, we don't have the potential conflict with Amtrak vehicles in downtown, but if there were other passenger vehicles, we would have the same issues. So it's very similar to the controls. Uh, probably more sophisticated controls would be required for the crossing downtown that exists now at the streetcar crossing of the CSX lines, and that's what one of the steps, early steps in the design process will be to work through that. 
Because right now, as I understand, we have um, the barest of uses of the CSX track, and we know that the barest of uses of Amtrak also. Um, and if we were to make any um, uh, great service um, with frequency and and others, it would be um, a different story than it is now with those crossings. But you're saying that that could definitely be accommodated on a more robust basis on both um, by both the streetcar as well as um, a passenger rail on the CSX track. Yes. Yes. Oh. Okay, um, that's one thing. The other is when I see these vehicles, so I see um, this picture that's before us right now, and it, it looks like, you know, an articulated bus um, with, the, like, the usually you have two connections. Of course, this has three. What is the capacity of this vehicle or the vehicles you're suggesting? Um, what? How many people do they hold? So that's the in the table, if that's still up on your screen, the seats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's different, the, the FTA re reports loading for the vehicles differently. So AW2 loading is essentially fully seated. Um, so you can see that 43 number is the number of seats. The AW2 loading includes some standing. So that 90 for the Brookville, 116 for the CAF, and that's the one in the picture is the CAF. And then 90 for the Siemens is the capacity with some level of standing. And it, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential variety in the internal configuration. So you could have fewer seats and more opportunities for standing. And in a lot of cases, communities will go with more room for standing because these are relatively short trips. So you might hop on, take three or four stops, and then hop off without feeling the need to sit and, and rest. Okay. Uh, um so they do have this compared to because you said what forty three to ninety kind of depending, but um, a, a typical articulated bus, as I understand it, would have about. I'm just trying to kind of get an uh, idea here. Mm -hmm. Would have about sixty sixty passengers as a relative comparison. And we'd be looking at around a hundred with some with, with seat, seating full and standing, but not terribly crowded. So that AW2 load is not the most crowded load that you would look at. It's not like a Tokyo subway where somebody pushes you in and closes the door. Right, This is a right. pretty comfortable load. Mm-hmm, okay. Um, the other, uh, you know, I know we saw the ridership changes, and I know it's been pretty dramatic. There was a time when I know we started the streetcar running more frequently. It was... Uh, the use of the streetcar has been, uh, you know, barely used, as we know historically, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then we started using it more frequently, but all of a sudden, FDOT put it in dollars so that it could be free, which is amazing. Um, but it's only three years' worth of dollars, and I think they put in a million to subsidize the um, operations. And, of course, that's what, um, in many ways, contributed to the operations increase, whereas our other buses and everything else we do, we charge. Um, and so it's um, – and there's uh, – I mean – I think it's great that we can offer it that way, and it also makes it for a more, uh, you know, um, speedy. People can get on and off without all the. It, it, sometimes it costs as much to collect the fares as it does as you know they they uh, contribute to the operation. So um, I, I like that possibility, but I have to say, um, more than even the initial capital investment, I'm extremely concerned. I always am about the operating costs. And when we talk about the operating costs, we're talking about um, 7 to $8 million a year, which I know when I heard that, I just think it's really important for people to understand that right now from our ad valorem uh, tax base, we um, have gotten $44 million. Now, I hope to get the money. I hope it, to put um, out, you know, another um, ballot measure. If, if we don't, um, I want to look at all this. But I am extremely concerned about those operations and who pays those operation costs. And, again, um, a, an equity issue in terms of um, if we were to concentrate that in just – which I – want this project, but if we were to concentrate $8 million in operations for this little corridor and it came from HEARTS, exclusively from HEARTS funding, is that, is that what is proposed here? 
No, currently, and we, this is a discussion that we've had with Hart over the last couple of years, is we've carried forward an assumption about a 50-50 split between the city and Hart for operations. Oh, okay. And there's additional sources that we're estimating. One of those is the the special the streetcar service district. Um, okay. With with Water Street and um, Water Street and um, Armature Works, if we expanded the boundaries, we've got a pretty good footprint, and it, it would anticipate an increase. To one and a half to two million over the early years of the project. So we've also got a dedicated source um, in line that's going to improve substantially um, in the early years. I'm greatly relieved to hear that. I was just very, very worried when I first heard those operational numbers, even with the sales tags. You know, in terms of. Um, uh, operations costs, and I and I think it would be excellent if we could provide this. So I wish we could provide all our transit free, um, but you know, um, oh, I think we need to especially be thinking about those things. So I um, I appreciate that. That's um, good information for me. And um, if I could, just from a sure. from an equity standpoint, is that mm -hmm. the we need we need to keep in mind that there's already an existing source of down, downtown specific funding that's dedicated to streetcar. So that's unlike other services that are provided across the county. You're not taking a um, you know a percent of the total value of a property and allocating that to transit in a specific location, except for downtown. So downtown is already, to a certain extent, paying some of its own way. Um, right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, that's okay. I was finished. Oh no, that's that's a good point, and I'm glad you make it. And I um. I just wanted to kind of understand because I, I really haven't understood exactly how um, that funding is done or intended on an operational basis, which, um, you know, it's one thing, capital. Um, the other thing is the ongoing um, cost of support. So that's, those are, that's good. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I have any, I don't have any further questions. I don't know if there's any other questions out there. Okay. Um, seeing none, let's move on to the, um, thank you for your presentation. Let's move on to the next presentation, the Streetcar Extension Project with uh, Mr. Jeff Booth and Infra Strategies. Sorry. I'll unmute myself now. Um, thank you. This is Jeff Booth with Infra Strategies, and thank you for the opportunity to present once again to the committee. And this will be sort of dovetailing what Steve's talked about and focus more specifically on the path forward for the project as it relates to what FTA will require, um, largely focused on the governance agreement, but other elements of sort of the project management plan and project approval to get a grant agreement. So let's go with the next slide. Oh, yeah, there you go. There we go. Okay. okay. Let's go to the one next steps. Okay, so the next steps, this lays out sort of a schematic of how the process proceeds. And I would say that um, this is a rinse and repeat process. And what I mean by that is that this is the process FTA follows every year for projects that would seek to be included in the president's budget. Now, the most important thing is that, as Steve mentioned, the August 2020 date is still somewhat of a floating date. And what I mean by that is that FTA held a listening session with project sponsors back in mid-May to talk about this cycle this year and made some comments to those who were part of the meeting about the fact that they were going to be updating guidance and perhaps updating a proposed rule that would implement changes that were made in the FAST Act. Well, I reached out to the FTA earlier this week, I guess yesterday, to ask them what was the status of the um, project submittal information based on these conversations you had with project sponsors in the middle of May, and my the response I got back was that, okay, we'll, they will be communicating with project sponsors. So I think it behooves a heart and the city to be reaching out to the FTA as to what they're going to do for this cycle. Because normally by now, if they were going to be making any changes to the, the submittals that would be required in August or September, those would have been published by now. So the fact is we're behind schedule for purposes of receiving project information for FTA to be able to review and process that information in time to submit a budget to Congress early next year. So I would just advise everybody to pay very close attention to that, to be reaching out to the FTA regional office to find out where they are in that process and when they would expect FTA to actually make that information available 
so you can understand to the extent that there are any changes in the project submittal information that would be required for this cycle. So I think it's important just to be aware of that, to be reaching out the FTA jointly by the city and HART to understand what, if any, changes they'll be making. And what the FTA does is then they review that information. And, and the critical thing about this process is in order to, to advance and be included in the president's budget, the project must re receive an overall rating of medium or better. And then that rating is divided into two parts. On the left-hand part is the project justification information that Steve talked about, which requires that that to be rated overall medium. But the right-hand part of that, that evaluation is the project financial plan, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later in my presentation because I think that's a critical question as the project moves forward to make sure that we can satisfy the requirements to be rated as medium or higher for the project financial plan. So that's important to take, take into consideration. Um, in addition, during this process, before we get a grant agreement, the focus will be on the project management plan. And I'll talk more extensively about that uh, a little bit later in my presentation. And at the end, we'll talk about what does it mean to have non-capital investment grant monies committed to satisfy the FTA to be able to rate and evaluate the project in order to be in the president's budget, because obviously all those monies must be committed by the time you get a grant agreement. Next. So let's go to the next slide. So statutory requirement is that all monies, the application will, applicant will have legal, financial, and technical capacity to carry out the project. And as Steve mentioned, that includes safety and security, as well as satisfactory control of all the equipment and the facilities, and technical and financial capacity to maintain those facilities. And so this is, you know, in the statute, but it's what I'll walk you through is what do those terms mean from the standpoint of how FTO will evaluate the project. But let's start with satisfactory continuing control. What this means in the eyes of FTA is that property funded by FTA will remain available to the project for its intended purpose through the useful life of the property's disposal. Well, what does that mean exactly? Useful life for the vehicles is typically 35 to 40 years. So they want to have, make sure you have access to the vehicle for the life of that vehicle to make sure you have access to all the property, and that's rights of way, uh, utility, utilities that are relocated, but rights of way that are available for the project, that they would be used for the intended purpose, or any property that is acquired for the project, for stations or station locations, or to address sort of curb cuts or, or turns that are required, that that project, that the property remains available to the project until it's disposed under the FTA requirements. And that really means in terms of real property that whoever is the owner of the system, we'll need to talk about that in a second, must have control or unconstrained access to acquisition, lease, or easement for a period of no less than 20 years. So whatever the agreement is based on who owns the underlying property, whether it be the city, whether it be Florida DOT, whoever owns that right-of-way, whoever's the owner of the system must have unconstrained access to that corridor for purposes of building it, operating, and maintaining it for the life of the project in no less than 20 years. So it's important, and that will be an issue that will have to be taken up in the governance screen, which I'll talk about in a minute. So next, on the legal side, yeah, let's put this way, right. I've led the, capital, the Community Streetcar Coalition since 2004. And there was a time in the early, sort of late 2000s and early 2010s where FTA was issuing, you know, build, build grants and tiger grants for many streetcar projects around the United States. And many times those projects were led by cities. And in the course of that process, FTA has, um, shall we say, wanted the project, the grant recipient, to be the primary entity that, that they relate with. One, because Hart, as the grant recipient, is familiar with the FT procurement rules, and ultimately the question is what one would assume that Hart is the primary owner of the system, given the fact that FTA dollars are flowing through them, but that's something that needs to be clarified. And I'll just give you sort of a, a, a comparable example for everyone to be considering of as you're moving forward. I do work on the downtown uh, Riverfront Streetcar Project in Sacramento, and it entailed the transit agency in two cities, cities of West Sacramento and Sacramento. And we lost three and a half years wrestling with the governance agreement because the cities wanted to be the lead and they wanted to create a not-for-profit to oversee the project. And FDA hated that idea. And while they wouldn't tell them directly that they hated the idea, they just never would approve the grant, the operating agreement or the governance agreement. And so ultimately, we lost time, the project costs increased, and now they've had to scale back the project. And so I only share that with you to understand that FTA really wants Hart to be the grant recipient and really wants Hart to be the primary entity that oversees this project. So the issue is working out between the city and Hart, who leads the process, working out the governance agreement to clearly define roles between Hart and the city, 
over the project, but they do, as, as it's been referred to me in my conversations with the FTA on streetcar projects before, the way they care for us is that we want one throat to choke. We want to know who we can go to in the region that is ultimately responsible for making sure this project gets built, operated, and maintained. And so that needs to be clarified in the governance agreement to make sure who, who is the ultimate entity that they go to to make sure that, that you meet the FTA requirements and the project gets built as, as promised. Next. On the technical side, they're shared on the right, the project construction and management guidelines that really guide sort of the project management process. And this, this manual is used, as Steve alluded to earlier, the project management oversight consultant. And so this, this is what they use to sort of guide and oversee a project. And it defines the requirements, the resource allocation, the activities, the management, how to monitor projects, how to make adjustments, QA, QC, and other requirements to basically have proper information to allow for timely decision to be made. And they use a risk-informed and performance-based project management process. And so the biggest issue that FTA will have with this, in my experience working on projects, is they expect the project sponsor, if that's the city or if that's heart, to have internal capacity to manage the project. And preferably that person also have somebody on their team that has previous experience working on streetcars. And so they want someone who has familiarity with the system, who has familiarity with streetcars, that has built a project of this type to be overseeing the project. And they will look at resumes of the people who are listed in the project management plan as having line responsibility for each of the tasks. And so they will review resumes to basically look and see the, the capabilities and pr prior experience of each of the persons that are on that on the chart of, uh, of the project sponsor to sort of deliver the project. And they really have an aversion to relying on seconded staff or outside consultants to serve in that capacity. And so this will be a conversation they have with FTA because obviously the issue for Hart, and this is a communication I'll have to have with FTA, is how much of that do we absorb internally knowing that if we don't have follow-on projects that will require that staff, will we help challenge recruiting those people to Hart to come for a period of three to five years to deliver the project versus the conversation regarding Relying on seconded staff or outside consultants to serve some of those roles. Public comment has left the meeting. So, so the question is, if, if we don't, so that's the way to challenge a project of this type is: do we have a body of work that follows it that allow you to recruit and hire people who see the possibility of staying for several years to deliver projects? And so that's just something based on my experience that you'll be wrestling with as you move forward, and that'll be a conversation to be had with FTA. Next. In addition with those, what I show you on the right is an org chart. It's just a representative chart out of the project management guidelines that they use for you to sort of begin to think about what your organizational structure would be. But they want to also make sure you have the capacity to manage and maintain the system, your existing bus network, through the Capital Investment Grants Project. So the thing they don't want you to do is to sacrifice service that you currently operate while seeking to expand the streetcar service. And so they will be review the org chart to make sure that the city and heart, depending on your roles, have filled each of the key positions and to assess their capacity, as I said earlier, to manage the project, to build it, implement, and operate it. So they'll be focused on that. And so this is just a representative chart on the right of a matrix organization that, that they've identified in the guidelines that you might model or look to as a possible guidance as you put together the org chart for the project management plan. Next. And critical issues, Steve talked about this a little bit on the governance issues. It's really cost allocation issues. Who's bearing the financial responsibility for the capital side to build it and the operating side to maintain it? Who bears the responsibility for cost overruns? And so that will need to be clearly articulated in, in the agreement as to where do we go to in the event that the project comes in above $237.8 million. And so that, that responsibility will have to be identified. And I will say as we get deeper in the project on the project financial plan, they'll want you to identify as in the project financial plan, where do we go, who is responsible, what is the source of funding to cover any cost overruns that may occur on projects. Because my experience is that you know, every project I've ever been on, something comes up in the quarter that was unanticipated. And most of the time that unanticipated event or activity in the quarter leads to an increased cost. And so it's important to just keep that in mind to make sure that we've identified where we might have to go and who would be responsible between the city and heart to cover the, any potential cost overruns in the court. In addition, they'll expect the governance agreement to nail down those responsibilities and have them be legally binding, which means they can't be loose. I mean, that has to say who is going to have the responsibility, who will pay these costs, what will be the funding source, 
and whoever you're responsible for the cost overruns and to lay that out very clearly in the governance agreement and the cost allocation agreement as part of the project financial plan, which we'll talk about in a second. In addition, the grant agreement has historically, for the last probably decade or more, included a provision that says that once you open the system, you must operate that system without a change in operations for five years after it opens to revenue service. Well, this has become a particularly challenging provision right now for many project sponsors. And so if you look at the FTA website, based on an input of a couple of my clients raised with FTA, they have waived this requirement for current grant agreements that open within the last five years because they recognize the impact of the pandemic on the source of funding for systems, as well as many systems have had to make operational changes in response to the economic shutdown of COVID-19. And so for right now, if you look in the FAQs, they have waived this requirement for the next year to 18 months for those projects that opened within the past five years. But this will be something to be keeping in mind as FTA begins to evaluate sort of what the impact is on COVID-19 and the economic shutdown as this project would move to grant agreement to see where we are at the time that this project actually gets a grant agreement because it is a condition of the grant, which means that if we have a change in the economy in the city of Tampa or Hillsborough County that would affect the revenue sources that we're utilizing, they're still going to expect you to commit to the operating plan that you laid out as part of the grant agreement. So it's important to, as you're putting together the financial plan, you're putting together the operating plan to keep that in mind as you're moving forward with the project. Um, with respect to bonding and finance, Financing, early project construction requires someone to bond and finance the early construction because if you look at the flow of dollars, the front end of project construction is the heaviest dollar amount being expended because you're letting all the contracts, all the major contracts are letting to get contractors getting to work in the project quarter. So the question is who has the bonding or financing authority or capacity to utilize the early project construction to sort of manage that until all the money's come from the federal government and the local government? This has also become an issue right now, that there is a provision in the, that's being proposed in the authorization bill that's in the House bill to allow for what's, used to, as what's called tapered match. And at least for the period of time with, with happening with COVID-19, the request is to allow FTA dollars to be the first dollar in, as opposed, as opposed to the last dollar in, and to allow the, to allow the non-capital investment grant dollars to be the last dollars in, to allow project sponsors to sort of address their current financial situation, to hopefully have some recovery in their revenues, to be able to not have to be have to be the first dollar in at a time where everybody is severely challenged due to COVID-19. And so that's something that's in the authorization bill right now. It's being proposed for the appropriation bill for FY21. And so it may become a permanent part of the statute for a period of time to address the response to the pandemic. And so that's something to keep in mind as well as the project moving forward. But it's important to also look at who's, who's bonding authority you're going to rely on in the event to finance early project construction. So that's something that also needs to be addressed in the governance agreement. Next. As I said before, the roles of each of the parties will be need to be identified. And what I've just identified for you here are some of the key issues. These are not all of the issues, but these are some of the key issues that will have to be addressed in terms of ownership of right away, right away, right away who owns the right away, but also under whose authority will, will the utilities be required to move. And and what I mean by that is that sometimes, in, in many cases, between cities and transit agencies, cities have a right that transit agencies don't have to require the utilities to move at their own expense. And so this becomes a question because the issue is also with utility location is by America. Because FTA has changed the rules about a decade ago that consider utility relocation to be a third-party agreement, which means that, that any utilities that are in the corridor would have to use by America compliant equipment with the one caveat being that the vehicles that Steve showed you, because the, the, the batteries on the vehicle and they don't have overhead cantilever wire, the utility re relocation impacts may be minimized as a result of that. But that's something to keep in mind as you're moving forward, that that may be a, a cost savings based on the vehicle you're utilizing that might minimize the impact on utilities due to the straight current because the power would be on the vehicle, not the overhead wire. So there's something to look at, but there's something that would also – understand who has the best authority, and this should, be, this should be reflected in the agreement, but it would also be reflected in what's in the scope of the project, because once it's in the scope of the project and the utilities have to be moved based within the scope of the cost of the project and the cost of the project, then the, that re relocation becomes then subject to Buy America. So those are just issues to be looking at as you're moving forward in advance in the project. You know, I've mentioned this before, cost responsibility of the three main things, capital operations and ongoing maintenance. And then how will fares be set or who will set the, the rules for operation and the operating conditions? And that's something that the city and heart will need to, to agree on 
if you're both actively involved in the project, who will set fares, how many hours the deal will operate, and I'll just say that FT would expect it to operate closer to its current schedule as opposed to how it previously operated before F.2 money's in. So that, that's important to understand in terms of FTA wanting to see you continue that level of operation and be able to fund that level of operation to demonstrate that you're operating service at least from like 6 a.m. To, to midnight or 11 o'clock, but at least in a span of service that will justify the FTA investment in the project corridor. Next. So among the grant agreements, these are some of the key this, issues are developing a cost estimate, integrated cost and project schedule, so looking at a reasonable schedule for what they would expect to see for the project moving forward, looking at the plans, constructability review, value engineering, the project management plan, which I've referred to before, and these are the elements of the project management plan that would have to be addressed uh, as, as far as uh, spelling that out in the agreement and, and the particular staffing plan and somebody be responsible for each of those se eight, seven tasks that I've identified just to sort of make sure that who is responsible for what, who's ultimately the party responsible, and to lay that out in the schedule and lay that out in the staffing and lay that out in terms of when that gets done. And I would strongly encourage, particularly for third-party agreements and right away, that an early, early action item would be to look at what right away will be necessary, what utilities will have to be moved. And I think any third-party agreements that would also include any conversations between the city and HART as well as for the DOT as a potential owner for some of the right away, just to make sure each of those are addressed in the agreement to understand each of everybody's roles and responsibilities for the project. Next. So as we go through the project development process, this is you, you, we're basically advancing now. You are in, currently in project development. And, and the thing to keep in mind right now is that you, you're in the, Steve mentioned you're in the midst of the environmental review process. Um, you, know, you, need, you need to gain all commitments of non-capital investment grant funding and, and a sufficient engineering design to allow the project to move forward. So that's where you are, and you're really where that green arrow is between getting the FTA rating between project project development and small starts grant agreement. Next. And I will just add one other thing. So not really necessarily, you don't have to go back to it, so I would just add one other thing, which is that at this point, um, there's lots of discussion on Capitol Hill, uh, particularly in the House uh, Authorization Bill and perhaps the House Appropriations Bill for FY21, that we may see both the overall project cost for small starts raised from 300 to $400 million. And the House Authorization Bill raised the federal share from 100 to $320 million. So we'll see whether the Senate goes along with that, but I do expect that the overall project cost to go up. But ultimately, whenever we get an authorization bill, and I also expect that the federal share will also go up when we ultimately get an authorization bill, whether that be this year or next year, but I do expect each of those numbers to rise. So by the time we go to the grant agreement, that could have a very positive impact on the project financial plan if the federal contribution is higher than was represented in our plan. So that's a positive to keep, a, keep an eye on as we move forward with the project, because that could ba basically be very positive for the region if, in fact, Congress adopts those changes. And so I'd encourage you to reach out to the delegation and communicate to them your desire for that, because that would be very helpful to the project to have that happen. And it would actually lessen the burden um, on the city and the county, excuse me, the city and heart, to come up with their share of the capital cost of the project. Okay, in terms of the financial plan, the key issue here is that um, Basically, um, for FTA, they're looking at, the, you look at the green boxes, looking at the current condition, the commitment of the money is so the reasonable of that commitment, it leads to the, fund, the financial commit rating. And the project's also rated at least medium, and if the capital investment grant share is less than 50%, then it'll raise your rating one level. Now, having said that, FTA's under a lot of pressure right now from Congress not to force project sponsors to overmatch. And so this may, in fact, be something that gets changed in the, the guidance that will be issued is that, you know, Congress is very unhappy with FTA pressuring project sponsors to take less federal money. In part, FTA was doing that due to the pressure on the program overall and trying to get more projects done. But, but Congress became very impatient with that. So this may be something that actually gets changed either through appropriations or through the authorization bill. But, but right now, if you overmatch, you can, you can increase your project rating. Next. And so the financial requirements is basically in the project development before you get to grant agreements, a system-wide financial plan. It's a 20-year cash flow statement. And you must prepare the financial template and the standard cost categories workbook lays out what you must do to identify the project cost. And at least 50% of the non-capital investment grants 
funding must be committed to request funding in the president's budget. Now, what does that mean? As Steve laid out for you the financial plan for the project, at the present time, if, if FDOT is willing through the New Starts program to show that those monies are committed, meaning they are in the, st the state's capital budget, they are laid out in the capital budget as being committed to the project, and given the share that they will represent for the project, they would represent more than 50% of the non-capital investment grant dollars to allow the project to go through the process Steve's articulated in terms of trying to move towards being rated and evaluated. So at that point, we could set, at this point, we could satisfy that for purposes of being included in the president's budget, or at least being included in the report that goes to Congress next February. But before we get the grant agreement, 100% of the non-capital investment grant monies must be committed, meaning that no further action is required by the city or by heart at any level so those monies are committed and dedicated to the project and that all final actions have been taken to make them available to the project to be able to go forward and get a grant agreement. Next. So just in a summary, I've laid out for you sort of the the key elements of the project and the key elements of the financial plan. And these are the things that would be reflected in the, the financial plan as you would begin to prepare that uh, for the project. And so this, you know, these are things that would be addressed. You laid out a complete financial plan that would be a 20-year financial plan. And I will go each, over each of them there in front of you right now. But those are things that would be required in order for you to, get a, to have FT review the financial plan and make a determination of whether the financial plan gets a medium or higher rating, which would be required in order to be included in the president's budget as well as to receive a, a small start grant agreement down the road. Next. And so as I said earlier, the key issue in, in, on the commitment is that there's no additional action required. And it must be programmed in the MPO's TIP and, the, and any sort of local, regional, or state capital improvement program or appropriations. And so we've identified some of the examples of those would be approved tax revenues if in fact the sales tax survives the Supreme Court challenge. State capital grants that might come to the for the DOT's New Starts program, cash reserves that may have been dedicated, or any other funding sources Steve alluded to in the reach within the project core that would be dedicated, and, and FT would engage a financial management oversight consultant that would stress test those revenue sources so that they would agree with you in terms of what those sources would generate. They would review them as to whether, in fact, they are available to the project, and they would sort of identify whether, in fact, in fact you've met the requirements for both commitment as well as the revenue sources you identified that they would agree with you that they are sufficient to build, operate, and maintain the project. With that, I think that's it. If I'm not mistaken. Oh, okay, sorry. One last thing. One other thing that's available to you is a simplified project rating, which is that it would allow you to get automatic medium rating if you meet certain requirements. So you look on the, in the chart below um, in terms of the number of trips in the corridor and the total project cost. So right now we would follow within the, the need to be 12,000 trips in the court or more to get a medium rating across those three criteria. At this point, I'm not sure what the ridership estimates are, but I'm not sure that we meet the 12,000 or more under the current warrants. Now, having said that, once again, in the House Authorization Bill, FTA is under pressure to expand the warrants, and so we may see some adjustment in those warrants. But what that does is reduce the amount of money you, have, you spend to have to develop three of the six criteria. Uh, if you can demonstrate that you meet the project cost thresholds on the left-hand side, and you meet the amount of transit trips in the corridor um, in order to get those medium readings. Next. And while this also still requires a 20-year financial plan to build, operate, meaning the project, they, they also con consider your financial condition of each of the partners, both the city and, and HART. And so I think the, the issue is really, you know, demonstrating that you have the monies available, demonstrating you have the monies in the operating budget, to make sure that the cost of the project is less than 5% of your current year approved budget, your operating budget. And so given sort of Commissioner Kemp's comments earlier, if in fact you're looking at the different revenue sources and so hard not paying the entire operating cost of the system, this would help make you more competitive in terms of looking at those other revenue sources so that it would not detract from current bus service. And then also want to look at audit, audited financial statements to look at positive cash flow. Um, and so I, these are just things to be looking at to take advantage of the warrants if we can meet the conditions that I referred to earlier in terms of the co capital cost of the project as well as the amount of ridership in the court. Next. With that, I'll open up for questions. Yes, yes thank you. This is Mayor Gasser. Uh Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff, for that presentation. I'm a little confused. I'm not sure if that was an 
informational, like a review of information or a pitch of some kind. Um, you know, a lot of that information as part of the consulting team, you're aware, has been uh, covered. And so, uh, and Milton Martinez checks in with the FTA every week. And we have on our staff here a, a member, Dave Vesolo, was actually an FTA staffer, so he clearly knows how these, these projects are uh, run. And in the override, that's a consideration in the, in the uh, estimation as well. And a lot of those issues are things that, you know, we're, we're going to have to deal with as we move along with this project. But I think the important thing right now is that we have all been on this path for two years and we, for the FTA, we have to show a very united voice here. So I'm, I'm just a little confused on what the point of the presentation was. Um, Mayor, I just want to make it clear that we, we need a very unified voice for this, this FTA uh, to, to get a solid rating on this project and then talk about the design and build that are going to be years, a couple of years down the road, you know, to talk about those issues and to come up with the solutions for each and every one of those. Mayor, with all due respect, I'm very much aware that Dave was involved in the project. I've known Dave a very long time, and you're absolutely right. I think the presentation that I was asked to give is to really say that at some point in time, the role of heart increases as the project moves forward. The role of heart will be elevated at some point in time. The role of heart as the grant recipient, and the issue is, will heart be the project sponsor? Will heart be the entity that will oversee the construction? And that's a key question in the eyes of FTA: Who's ultimately responsible for building, operating, maintaining the system? And what is the roles and responsibilities of heart versus the city? Because at some point in time. FT will look to Hart to play a greater role than the city's than than it has currently played. If in fact Hart's going to be the owner of the assets, to be the builder of the project, and be the party financially responsible to build, operate, maintain the system. And so the point today, which is simply put on your radar screen as a Hart board, that the fact is that there will be a transition going on um, between the city and Hart to elevate the role of Hart that it, that it has played to date. If, in fact, Hart is the entity that will be the grant recipient, if, in Hart is the entity that will play a larger role in project delivery, um, and so those, my point was simply to bring those issues to your attention and understand that, based on my experiences working on other streetcar projects in the United States, which is to identify those issues to you, so you understand that FTA will expect to see Hart playing a larger role than it has played to date, because the city has largely been the lead to date. But at some point in time, Hart will need to take a larger role as the grant recipient, and presumably, and that's something for you all to decide, will it be the project sponsor? Will it be the project manager? Will it be responsible for project construction? And so my point is only to raise those issues at this point um, for you to consider having worked on a lot of streetcar projects between cities and transit agencies and what FTA's expectation is from this phase moving forward to the grant agreement. No issue with that. I think that um, those are conversations that, you know, we're all willing and, and to have uh, down the road and whoever is best to, to continue as the lead in this project, um, we're all for. I just want to ensure that we have a united voice right now so that we can put our best foot forward uh, to the FTA. Thanks. Are there any other comments? Any other comments? I, I have a uh, question. Uh, sure, um, go ahead. This is Commissioner uh, Overman. Thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate the presentation because it brings up of kind of why we all are here. Um, the streetcar project, yes, is a we do need to stand on a unified front. I don't disagree with you at all there. Um, I, I think what I heard, however, is the in order for this application process to go well, there are some uh, a few key decisions that need to not only not necessarily be implemented but be committed to. Right. And um, for example, you made mention that the uh, you know who is going to 
be responsible for the operating funds? Who's going to be responsible for the project management? And who's going to be responsible for, um, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the underlying capital that's required? And while I think we all are in agreement that this is a great partnership between Hart and the city, uh, what I didn't hear earlier was that the MOUs were clear and understood because, you know, and, and to have those, those MOUs um, developed with the idea that the ongoing revenue from, for the surtax is going to be any part of the equation is, is challenging because not only do we not have it now, but we don't know if we're going to have access to the capital. And if we do have it or don't have it now, then we have to wait till 22 to get it. <laughs> and that's assuming the voters are going to go for it, um, depending on where we are as, as far as, a, um, as a, an economy as a whole. So I'm... You know, I am a planner. I do think about these things and do run projections and have obviously have not run the numbers here. But I am very concerned about not at least having an understanding of who will have to creatively solve the problem. And whether that's Hart, whether that's the city, whether it's the county, whether it's, you know, private enterprise, I don't know. But Ongoing operating costs is something that uh, frequently is a very difficult thing to have and is absolutely necessary for any transit system to operate. So, uh, you know, part of the reason why I'm glad we're having this here is because, you know, the other boards, the committees that present to the board for approval, you know, they're dealing with the actual numbers. But here we're looking at the long-term impact of our partnership and how that needs to develop and be held to account. So do we have those MOUs in place? Have the financial commitments been made? Are we making assumptions based on fact and agreements or on what we hope will happen? And I'll stop there. Uh, I don't know if there's, if those were, Rhetorical, or were they? Uh, you wanted you. I don't know if there's somebody that can answer those, or that was just. Go ahead. I think they have to be answered. If we're going to, I, I do think they have to be answered. I just didn't know if we had someone now. I think. Uh, go ahead. The operational agreements are. This is Mayor Castor again. The operational MOUs are in place, but as far as mm -hmm. operational, um, you know, we, we have to look at possibilities with that. Clearly, first and foremost would be the surtax if we were able to get that. We could look I at... Know, we've just been extending them. We haven't even discussed this. Okay, somebody's talking if the somebody microphone. needs to oh, mute sorry. themselves. <laughs> Excuse me, um, Madam Chairman, this is Carolyn Stewart. May I address something? Um she may. Um, I think you cut off Mayor Castor when she was in the middle of her statement. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but, Go ahead. Um, so, Mayor Castor, maybe you want to finish what you're saying? Just that as far as the operations, that there are possibilities. I think that's, you know, that's what we can say is that surtax, clearly, if that works out. But if not, you know, we can look at a variety of ways. I think the um, overarching uh, idea is that this is something that we need to move forward in with transit and it's something that's demanded by our communities. That's all. Thank you, Carolyn. All right. And, and, and go, I don't know, if, I guess, Ms. Stewart, if you want to make a, a comment to this? I wanted to address a question regarding the MOUs. The MOU that's currently yes. in place is for the existing system that's 20 years old. All we've done is continue to um, renew, re renew and extend, but this is for an ex expansion of the existing system, which would require a totally new MOU. It is not in place. We have not seen the draft. Uh, in December, we had a discussion with the city that we are in support of this project, of course, in principle, but... Certainly the MOUs would drive Hart's commitment, 
and, and HART's responsibilities, et cetera, et cetera, and we did have some problems with the existing agreement that has put HART uh, in a place where HART had to expend finances which were not anticipated when the initial agreement was in place, and so we know that this is a total new MOU, and we do not even have a draft from the city as to what it would look like and we did ask for that back in December because we understood that that would be part of what would be needed uh, to go forward. And it is, was supposed to be forthcoming. We've not received it. At our last meeting, we were told, no, it's pushed back. But as you heard from the presentation from Mr. Booth, that is something critical that needs to be a part of this. And so that's what I wanted to address. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Before we continue. Uh, can I just have some clarifications from Mr. Booth, just to clarify this? Um, the t schedule for creating a new MOU and then um, submitting, we're talking about August, for some kind of uh, present, uh, uh, something to the FTA, preliminary. So the MOU n needs to be completed a new, I would think a new MOU, first of all, needs to be done. Second of all, that it, th is this a timeline where we're being told today that this MOU has to be approved um, in August? No. For, okay. Don't hear me say that. Don't hear I just me wasn't sure. I'm not, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I'm just trying to clarify for no. myself, if not others. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me clarify that better, okay? So uh -huh. what you're doing between now and August or whenever FTA wants you to submit the project justification information is you are simply submitting to them sort of the, the information necessary for them to rate and evaluate it on the left side of the ledger, which is the six project justification requirements. And on the right side of the ledger, the financial with at least 50% of the non-capital investment grants dollars committed. And at this point, the FDOT New Starts program could satisfy that requirement. So that would let you check that box on the right side in terms of the financial plan. And then Steve and his folks at HDR have been putting together and developing the materials on the left side of the box with the six project justification criteria. So provided that we can get a medium on both the left and the right side of the box in order to get an overall medium, then the project can be rated and evaluated for purposes of being included in the president's submittal to Congress in February of next year. So that's, that meets that, that requirement. Now, from this point going forward, what has to happen before we get a grant agreement is that we would then begin the process, once we've advanced, to begin to develop the project management plan. And as part of the project management plan, the governance agreements would ne need to be nailed down and agreed upon by the city and HART. And so that would be done bet before, between now and before we get a grant agreement for the project. So that gives you the next period of time before you are in the position to get a grant agreement to be able to, to nail those documents down and to get agreement between the heart and the city. So the only point was to put this on your radar screen to say, okay, this is where we need to concentrate work going forward in order to get a grant agreement as part of the project management plans to begin to articulate roles, responsibilities, financial commitments, all those things that, as um, Carolyn mentioned in her statement, those are things that have to be up updated and modernized or refreshed to be able to move forward with the project to get a grant agreement under the Small Starts Program. So this is only to put those on your, on your radar screen, have them be areas of focus for the next several months and year plus, but it wouldn't keep you from getting the project rated and evaluated this fall. I see. I, I really this, wanted... This is Steve Shecraft with HDR. I was going to piggyback on what, um, sure. what Jeff just said. Is that we, we've also been in conversation since we've been in the project development phase with FTA about this. So there's we've... We've indicated on previous calls and in discussions with FTA that that's one of, we recognize that's one of the requirements, that there are issues about um, ownership of assets, about responsibilities for ongoing operation and maintenance, and then we have to clarify the commitments about design, oversight, and construction management through this process. So we've had that discussion. We recognize that's a big part of what has to happen next, and the cities um, included the the both the resources to support that work, um, and it's been scoped in the scope for the design effort, which would be coming up in the next several months. But Steve, okay. this about that, but this, the heart needs to be, I mean, so the question is, who's going to put that information together, and what heart's role needs to be elevated? Oh, there's no, yeah, yeah Jeff, I'm not indicating in any way that that's not the case, but this really needs to be 
um, especially from FTA's perspective, a really strong partnership between the city and Hart with a high amount of detail regarding who's taking the lead and who's providing support on each of the phases of the project or elements of the project. I'm not taking issue with you, Scott, Steve, because I agree with you, but I'm just saying that I think FTA is going to want to see if, if Hart is the grant recipient, they are the, the entity managing the federal dollars because they are the only grant recipient in the county, their role needs yes. to be increased. And that, that's my point today to the board and to the committee is just to understand that Hart's role needs to be elevated from what it has been to date. And I think this is really valuable discussion and valuable for the board to understand um, and for us to understand in moving forward how we do this. Um, and obviously, um, you know, I, I quickly, I had asked about those operating funds in the past and um, quickly had asked a few people, uh, did you know about the operations that, you know, that there were some shared functions and things like that, um, and they said that they had, because I'd asked about them internally before and had only heard that, you know, Hart or I don't know who would be paying them. Uh, but um, they had said that they had not been part of that conversation. So I, it sounds like, and to your point, um, Jeff, that as I remember when you started this presentation, you said uh, Sacramento's process got held up for several years. Is that what you said? Because it was a Sacramento or San Diego or something because the this it sounds like this piece kind of wasn't worked through in, to meet the FTA standards or what they were looking for. I'm just trying to save you time. I mean, that's really why right. I want to break this presentation because we lost three plus years in Sacramento arguing over something between the two cities because they did not want the transit agency to be in charge of the project. And they wanted to follow the Portland streetcar model of having not-for-profit oversee the project. Portland Streetcar was done, it was not done through the FTA process. It was done totally without federal dollars. But if you talk to FTA today, they would never allow that to happen ever again. And so their insistence is with Hart as the grant recipient, they want Hart to have a, the, the major role. That doesn't mean the city doesn't have a role, but as a grant recipient, they want the transit agency to have a very large role in project delivery and project funding and overseeing the project. Now, obviously, the city and Hart will need to allocate those roles because the city, you know, owns a lot of the right-of-way, and the question is, the city owns the sidewalks? So there's a role for both parties, but that just needs to be articulated in the governance agreement so that we clearly know who has responsibility for each of the tasks and who has responsibility to build, operate, maintain the system. So my presentation today was, don't take it as I don't support the streetcar. Many of you may not know, but I actually represented Hart when we got the original funding for the trolley pro for the street project back in the early 2000s. So I've been around this project for a long time, and I'm a big advocate of the project. But my point is just simply that it's time to start paying attention to those issues. And I understand, as, as Carolyn mentioned, that they all need to be updated to reflect the fact that you're now advancing a much bigger project that's been done with federal dollars, and the FTA, as the, as the, the entity that will be granting the monies, has certain expectations around the project and the governance agreement that will have to be addressed going forward before the project will get a grant agreement. Uh, Madam Chairman, this is Dave Mechanic. Can I ask? Sure, a go ahead, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jeff, w I think we all have a clearer picture of what mm -hmm. needs to happen. But the one thing you didn't say is, based on our current timing, when does that MOU need to be ready? I mean, I understand these things get shifted and delayed, but Based on your current schedule, when would that MOU need to be in place in order to allow us to begin having uh, entering into a grant agreement with the FTA? Okay, well, I guess I'd say this, that, that it must be in place um, in, in order to allow FTA time to rate and evaluate the project and initiate the internal process within the agency and with the, what, the Office of Management and Budget, et cetera, to get the grant agreement. So I would say that if you're hoping to be funded in fiscal year 22 that starts October 1st of next year, that that, grant, that governance agreement needs to be in place by the spring, at the latest, this coming spring. That's the latest. And the, the longer that doesn't get resolved, <laughs> the deeper you'll go into fiscal year 22 before you get the grant agreement, because that is a critical piece for the project management plan. It's a critical piece for FTA to rate and evaluate your project 
to make sure that you've met all the requirements as part of the guidance that they give to every project sponsor to meet those guidance requirements. That has to get put in place. And so my only point today is it's time to start paying attention to those issues. Don't let them linger. Begin to really sit down and have the hard conversations about the roles and responsibilities because these things can take time because they're both there are, rep there are examples out there of other systems that have entered into governance agreements, but the reality is that every governance agreement between the city and a transit agency over a streetcar project is local. It's all driven by local projects, local history, local partners. And so while there are current issues that get addressed in the governance agreement that are part of all governance agreements, the ultimate resolution of those issues and how you choose to address those issues is very localized. Uh, Jeff, I understand. Did you say th you s this spring... Are you saying spring of 2021? I'm saying spring of 2021 if, in fact, we're trying to hit the schedule of being available to get a grant agreement by October 1st of 2021. I mean, I'll just say this, that nobody hits that schedule. I mean, I mean, there are so many projects in the queue right now. Like, let's take your neighbors across the, across the bay at Pinellas Suncoast Transit. They've been trying to get their grant agreement for over 18 months. And they've just been waiting for F to allocate them dollars. And they're finally seemingly on a pathway to start getting a grant agreement um, from what my conversations with them because they're part of the Capital Investment Grants Working Group that I lead. So I've talked to them in terms of their experience. So what we can have October 1st of 2021 as a target, um, I, mean, I understand that that's going to be a function of the availability of dollars. It's going to be a function of other projects in the queue. And it's going to be a function of how, how well we resolve the issues locally to make the case for FTA that we're ready. And so the critical issues to resolve locally that will dictate readiness have to do with the governance agreement. They have to deal with the funding for the project to build, operate, maintain the system. And so those are critical issues that in the eyes of FTA that we have to resolve in order to get a grant agreement. And until those are resolved, we can't begin to have a serious conversation with FTA about the grant agreement until we can address those issues. I I mean, that all seems fine to me. I mean, that's uh, very logical, and I, I think spring of next year is more than doable. Uh, we all know what we have to do between now and then. Uh, but I, I, I just wanted to be clear that w the, the sky is not falling now. No. We are, no, no. We are, we are on schedule, and, and there doesn't seem to be any problem with being able to move forward with an MOU here. So, I mean, I just think there's enough time to get that accomplished. May I ask a question, sure. please? Go ahead. Commissioner okay. Overman. Thank you. Um, and that wasn't my intent to show that there was a problem. What I thought it was important for us to do is to recognize that we have a task that we must accomplish you know, by next spring, thank you very much for our date. Um, I like deadlines. And uh, that if we move forward or make a recommendation to move forward on this now, there is an in incumbent uh, need to have that MOU worked on between now and next spring. So uh, to avoid what Jeff had described as being a real challenge in another community that hadn't had that that detail committed to prior to making a decision to move forward. So I, I love the project. I think we should move forward. I think we should do this. But I do think that it's important for us to recognize that it is going to require working out the details very soon uh, should we choose to recommend that the board approve moving forward on this project. That's all. That's all there is to it. So. That's, that's why I asked the question, not to challenge whether or not it's something we should or shouldn't do. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah. Are there are there any other comments right now? Uh, um, I'd, sure, I'd yeah. like to make a motion. Yes, sure. Yeah. Uh, 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 before we have a uh, Commissioner Castor, I mean, sorry, Mayor Castor. Uh, no, that's what I, I was going to make a motion that that um, that we recommend as a committee to the board. Uh, to direct the staff to provide the city with a letter of recommendation for the streetcar extension as part of its submittal for the FTA ratings. And I don't know. I'll, uh, I'll second they, that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we have uh, a motion and a second. And I'd just like to uh, say for the record, I think this was a, 
very worthwhile discussion, one that it was really important to have to move forward. I don't think that there was any implication on the part of anyone that, um, you know, they're not uh, supporting the project um, or certainly not on my part, and we've heard from others. I, I think that there is a lot of support for the project moving on, but I do think it's really important for us to um, recognize our roles and do the, the best by those and, um, and, and work out uh, these kinds of responsibilities because this is um, a huge and important commitment. Uh, and I'm glad for the clarification uh, that was um, made by Mr. Booth. Um, with regards to to these issues, so I um, I didn't want that to be seen uh, by anyone as not rep not um, supporting the project, as as Commissioner Overman said, and others. So with that, I guess unless there's any other comments, we can take a vote. We have a, a mayor a Mayor Castor's motion to do a letter of endorsement, seconded by uh, David Mechanic. Are there any other comments to be made? Seeing none, um, staff, will you uh, do a roll call? Yes, this is Danielle from Hart. Please say yes or no after your name is called. Committee Chair Kemp. Do we have staff there? Yes, this is Danielle. <laughs> Can you hear me Can now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah but you're an echo. <laughs> where did I get? Where did I get? Where did I get? Where did I get? Hang on, hang on. Let's see. Lena, you have okay. me muted. You have me muted. Right there, right there, unmute that. Are we cleared up here? I'm sorry, this is Danielle. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. I'm sorry about that. Please say yes or no after your name is called. Committee Chair Kemp. Yes. Director Hardin. Director Hardin. Director Castor. Yes. Director Mechanic. Yes. Director Overman. Yes. And Director Hardin's no no longer muted. Director Hardin. Can you hear me? I Yes. Thank yes. you. The motion passes five to zero. Great. Thank Thanks for the presentation, all the information. I thought it was a great discussion. Um, we'll move next to the 2020 performance metrics. Um, Chris Cochran, Director of Service Development, you're recognized. for FY20. Um, this is a unique presentation in that um, we are in a um, bit, obviously a bit of a unique um, time period here. We are able to provide you um, as much information as possible in consideration of um, the um, COVID events that are going on. So um, please, uh, please understand um, there are some very slight limitations to what we are um, able to provide in whole to you uh, based on your request today. So next slide, please. <clears throat> the uh, the first uh, uh, bit of information we can provide to you today is the total year-to-date ridership through April. Um, um, I, I apologize for the um, for the second header within the graphic itself. It should say year to date ridership through April 2020. So this is actual raw ridership by route by frequency. Um, through the month of April 2020. Um, I don't think there's any real big surprises here. Um, we do see that the higher frequency routes um, do perform um, um, much better in ridership um, in that we have concentrated um, putting more frequency on those core routes that we know are um, serving um, the higher ridership corridors, uh, those being the Route 6, the Route 1, uh, 434 and, and uh, Route 12. Um, in in all those uh, 
Those routes carry about a little over 40% of the total ridership for the entire system. Um, that should be noted. I, I think that's worthwhile noting. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. The remainder of the slides, um, when we get into the cost per passengers um, and, the, and, the, and the cost per hours, um, please understand that, that we could only do these through February um, as our service changes that went into effect starting March, um, we were not on the regular hours um, that were that were put out as part of our service modifications in March. Those were changed. Um, so we were not able to um, accurately reflect the hours to our software program, um, which is how we generally put out these um, ridership numbers. It's a little technical, um, but it does give you a very good idea of um, uh, of the cost per passengers through February. Do understand that's why there's a limitation there. Um, so the cost per passenger, these are very inversely proportioned to um, the ridership. Um, again, nothing in uh, a huge surprise here. When we look at our 15-minute um, frequency routes, we see that those are in generally the lowest um, the lowest cost per passenger. Um, and then um, by 30 minute, it gets a little bit higher um, and 60 and, and express routes um, um, and so on. Um, I think the next slide, please. When we look at this, this is really a, a nice look um, uh, holistically at the system and our cost per passenger um, reflective to um, to the, in, in, in terms of frequency in the system, we do see a more um, efficient cost per passenger. Um, um, if, if we only look at that metric, when uh, we are looking by frequency, the average cost per passenger within the system right now is, uh, excuse me, through February was at $6.14. Um, but you do see it's a significantly less than the 15 minute frequency, um, and the remainder of them are above that average. Um, the, the express routes. Um, are, are obviously um, the the big uh, the big ones that really um, the the big ones that really create the the large difference. But we don't certainly don't have nearly as many hours um, invested in the express routes as we do the 15 minute uh, frequency and 30 minute routes, which is what keeps that cost down a little bit. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Now, when we look at the cost per route. This also makes sense as we look um, in those top five routes that, again, had the highest ridership. We invest the most amount of money in those um, as well. Um, uh, putting 15-minute frequency out there on those routes, we put the most amount of buses and the most amount of hours on the street for those. Um, thus, they cost the most amount of money. This first slide that we're looking at, we have... Um, uh, two different rates. Uh, we, we have a marginal rate um, and we have a uh, fully allocated rate. The marginal rate is really looking at um, a $65 an hour rate, which does not include um, the, the cost of acquiring brand new drivers. So if we were to put out a whole bunch of new service and there is a need to go acquire new drivers, that is a fully allocated rate that we need to consider. Um, if we are able to adjust um, routes and use existing riders, uh, excusing, excuse me, existing drivers, um, then we can consider a marginal rate um, for, for that. And there is a little bit more uh, detail um, um, in terms of that, but it's really um, uh, taking in, in, into consideration um, um, the, the acquisition of, uh, of FTEs and, and, um, and, and cost across the entire agency. Um, but again, this is, um, this is uh, uh, again, no, I, I don't think any of these slides are going to be of any big surprise to any, uh, uh, any of us here. 
Um, you know, the, the less frequency we have, the less cost there is, um, and, and it's almost exponential, um, if you will, just based on, on, uh, on the frequency here. Uh, we do see the express routes. There is uh, significant costs in, uh, in a couple of them there. Um, and, I, and I will speak to um, how we are looking at um, um, the express routes for service modifications um, um, in the next presentation. Next slide, please. So this is the cost per route um, at the fully uh, at the fully allocated cost of $108. It's really the exact same. Um, visually, it's exactly the same. The dollar amount is is uh, just a little different. So, um, and if we can look at the final slide, um, a, a final important metric that we do look at is passenger per revenue hour. Um, now, this is an interesting um, slide um, when we do look at the um, passengers per revenue hour, we certainly see um, a, a solid consistency in the 15 minute uh, frequency um, um, uh, category for passengers per revenue hour, but we do do very well in a great deal of the 30 minute frequency um, category for some passengers per revenue hour, as well as a couple of the 60, well, at least, at least one of the 60 and a couple of the express routes uh, do relatively well for the passengers uh, per revenue hour. Um, I, I think in whole, what, um, what would be of note in this is when we look at the total cost of, of operating, um, we have about $30 million of the operating cost. Um, it, well, for the, the highest frequency routes, those 15 minute frequencies routes, those make up about 30% of the entire operating cost um, of, the, uh, um, of all of our routes. Um, and I, I think that's, that's something to take um, into consideration when we begin to talk um, in the next presentation about the budget and part of our strategy in approaching um, um, our strat um, how we looked at, at our uh, potential uh, service modifications. So um, with that, I'd be happy to, uh, to take any comments um, and questions from the committee. Are there comments or questions? <clears throat> um, I have a few. <laughs> yes, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, this to me, uh, I've asked for it several times, and I, uh, I know Ms. Stiglitz um, had given me something on this, and I was really, I think it's really important for our board as we move forward and we talk about um, budget cuts, frequency coverage, and all that to understand um, this as well. Um, I think this is very important. If I go down to just a couple of questions specifically. I, I thought this was a very, I mean, I've kind of known this all along, but I think it's very important that this be presented all the time uh, in our monthly um, uh, minutes that we have or monthly reports that we have in, so that um, this is internalized because I think it's very important for our board as we consider uh, uh, the how we, how heart moves forward, the service it does, um, it's essentially making choices uh, between the coverage we do, the frequency, and what we want to do. Um, one of my questions is this. I think it's still hard to judge uh, until we see something like heat maps on every route so that we can see where people get on and where they get off and where is most important. Uh, for instance, you know, I don't know. I'm just wondering, and I'm wondering um, uh, how some of these places serve. Uh, is it the stop uh, before the airport or the stop before downtown or wherever? Where Where is the highest, uh, you know, um, ridership service, and it, and what exactly within these routes should we be concerned about? So. Could we can we start seeing uh, as well uh, heat mapping of routes? Uh, yes, ma'am. We actually, um, uh, Commissioner, we um, as part of the ongoing um, COA that we have going on right now, um, we will uh, that will be. 
part of the analysis that we can bring forth to you. We have a brand new tool that we have access to that actually um, we, are, we are developing all of the data into it, um, being able to gain a, 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 a better understanding of how to use that tool. And um, I think that will be helpful in being able to bring forward to you if that's, um, uh, it sounds like that's something you would like to see and, and, um, it, and, and we can do that. There was also a page in there where the express routes were. I know it's only a few pages long, but if we go back, um, if we go forward, um, keep going, keep going, keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we go to these last two, I think it's, uh, um, I was curious, the express route, go back to the other page, it's kind of clear, one page back six. Yeah, you can see better there. The 275LX is at um, one uh, point or one million uh, one hundred and seventy-one thousand. So you were saying that the more buses on these express routes, the more cost. So that would be um, one something you would say that that was attributed to frequency. Well, what it. That one is not not only frequency, but because it is so long, it's coming from Wesley Chapel. So um, there was a need for um, a, you know more buses on the 275 LX to meet that 60 minute frequency. So okay. that that, that so attributes to uh, that extended cost on that. So it's so it's um, I see, and so this the. The new iteration of this, I think we're cutting out the part from the uh, university area center to Wesley Chapel. Is that correct? Uh, that would that would actually be what what we would propose to keep as that as from Wesley Chapel to UATC um, and end it there. That would be the proposal as that carries the majority of the ridership on that route that we've uh, that we are able to see as of now. Oh, so the majority of ridership is going from Wesley Chapel to the university area on that route. Yes, ma'am. And not using the rest of that route. Uh, correct. Okay, so if that is, it, and this is just goes to the next, I didn't really understand that. That's why a heat map would be so valuable. Okay, so Certainly. are we, are, are we going to be paying for that alone? I mean, it is one that crosses county borders, and um, so I just have a question about that service. Well, we are, um, we are getting clarification from DOT that we um, will still be able to take advantage of the corridor funding that is in place that would, um, that would contribute, um, I, 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 I want to say $280,000 um, a year to that. Um, and um, so um, I, I believe that's, that's the total amount um, there, but um, if um, th there is DOT funding available for that, um, if we are able to continue um, using that that corridor funding, uh, we are we are talking to DOT. Being that we are are looking at the potential of changing that route so much from what the original was, um, we we just have to get. Um, them to uh, validate that we'll continue to be able to get that funds. But that will be a consideration going into how we move forward with um, continuing that route. Um, as, as this is a, you know, that's a draft, um, you know, this is all a draft proposal um, as we, we can talk about more in, in, as in the next presentation. Okay, so we would get a, a cost basis for that and also, I guess, Either D it seems to me that that should be totally covered by DOT <laughs> as an inter-county route um, in all ways or, um, or else also a contribution. If it was just totally on us, it would seem like a contribution um, by uh, PASCO um, because, you know, I'm, I would imagine that it is incoming more so than outgoing in terms of, um, I mean, I know people come in and go back, but um, more a service to Wesley Chapel than uh, to the university. I'm not, you know, so I would like, I'd be curious about that. Um, and then, um, 
So I guess we could get a, uh, we would find out what the cost would be, what the frequency and all. I, I just feel like to make these kinds of judgments, we have to have an analysis like that on each and every um, cut, addition, whatever it is that you're uh, asking us to make, a full analysis. Um, and then if we just go to one more, I'm just curious. There is another place where the mango route had high passenger revenue. Uh-huh, right there, the Mango, is that Net Park? So, where, again, a heat map would be helpful. I noticed that that goes to the Hard Rock Casino. I just didn't know if that was um, where, you know, where the um, ridership is on that um, and, you know, how I was impressed by the numbers, but I'm just wondering, you know, about that route in particular. Sure, and, and, and you know, I, I do want to reiterate that, that, the, that exactly the questions that you're asking um, is, is what the network evaluation that is ongoing is, is looking at in detail so that we can establish, um, you know, the best adjustments to make. Are there routes that we don't need to go as far as we were before? Um, do we need to go further um, because we see market potential to go further on certain routes. So exactly what you're asking is part of the network evaluation that's ongoing. And uh, well, gosh, well, let's move to the network evaluation, I guess, and not concentrate on this. I just thought this was very interesting, and I appreciate the fact that it was done. I think it's important to, to keep, uh, as we move and evaluate routes, that we always have this information. Chair, Commissioner Chair, Oberman has, yes. Sure, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, you're recognized. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, Ms. Cochran, an excellent presentation. Um, to the Chair's point, uh, putting this chart and six together with the bars next to each other would be enormously helpful. Because not only would we see the actual a cost, I think that's on six, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then next to the revenues per hour. Uh, and then the next chart. Could you go to slide eight, please? Oh, all right, well, then back up. <laughs> uh, I think it was the cost per hour. Yeah, I guess that's what it was. What's the one just before that? Cost per passenger, perhaps, or is that? Yes, cost per passenger, uh, number, I believe. No, number three, please, if you could go there, yeah. Yes. Is that what you were looking for, com Commissioner? Yeah, I, well, it is to some extent. So the, yeah. the last two slides next to each other for the routes, the revenue as compared to the cost, would be helpful to see that together because we would see basically the equivalent of ROI on the, do, on the on that route and its effectiveness. And then if, in fact, you decide based on ridership and effectiveness in those areas of the routes that may or may not be as uh, utilized, for example, Mr. Kemp's point that, you know, they ride from Wesley Chapel to the university area, but then they don't ride all the way to the airport. Um, so is, is, that a, is there another way to do that? Is an example. I'm not saying that is what to do. But I, I think your point, too, when you're looking at the ones that were next to each other, um, like the mango one, that was the lowest cost and the highest revenue, which is obviously something that is helpful. But that may not necessarily tell the whole story. Um, the folks that take the bus from mango clearly take the bus from Mango because they need transportation. So I had asked, I can't remember which meeting, but when we were talking about route development, um, to see an overlay on transit-dependent communities as it compares to this analysis where we're showing why are we investing in these particular routes because that is laden with 
um, those that absolutely need this as a way of getting around and functioning in their life. And, um, and that becomes important when we're looking at this chart on three where we're looking at frequency. If we find that we have routes where there's transit-dependent communities, where there's some wiggle room in the net, cost versus revenue that allows us to increase frequency, that may actually in the long run improve profitability, if you want to call it, or net, net revenue, um, or the ROI. So I, I, I appreciate what you've shown us here, um, but I'm not seeing how these routes or how these cost per, passion, cost per passenger comparisons are helping me recognize whether or not we're addressing those transit communities or transit dependent communities that that heart can do so well. And uh, I, I understand. Unless it's in the next next show. <laughs> no, I, I I I that is something that we can absolutely put together for you. Um, it you know as part of you know the next presentation is for us to um, ask for us to begin the process of going out for taking a plan out for public outreach, getting feedback from the community. Um, as part of that is a Title VI, um, is a, an entire Title VI process. Um, as part of that Title VI process, that's exactly the type of analysis that we are required to do. Um, and I think that will help answer your questions. Um, but if it's something that, that you would like um, um, sooner, I, 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 I'm confident we could put together, um, you know, we can put together something for you um, relatively, relatively quickly. It's, you know, the, the data's out there. We can, we can just overlay it on some GIS, and, and we have that capability to do. So. Thank you. I look forward to seeing that. Yes, ma'am. Thank, thank you for your comments. I think as we move forward, it's really important, and I really appreciate your comments, Commissioner. Uh, you know, and looking at equity <laughs> as we move forward, um, and uh, as well, um, I, you know, I, I kind of think, and it, we'll go into the next one, but we kind of need a coronavirus when it's on discussion and when it's off. And one of the things about coronavirus is when we still have our heavily used routes, um, by having more frequency, even if it's fewer people, we need the social distancing on our buses as well. So those might be well taken, but uh, to that, that's another consideration um, to have. So anyway, um, if we could, I guess, move on to the next presentation if there's no more comments. Director Mechanic okay. has his hands up. Uh, I'm sorry? Director Mechanic has his hand up. Uh, right, right. The presentation is, the next one is the potential service modifications and budget implications um, with um, Ms. Cindy Stiglitz. Committee Chair, um, Committee Member Mechanic has his hand up and so does Mayor Castor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did not, I could not hear that. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, go ahead, um, uh, Director Mechanic. Uh no, I think my hand up was, was up for the last discussion, not for this one. Sorry. I have it. Okay. And I'm not sure if um, Mayor Castor. Okay. Okay. I thank you for pointing that out. So I guess seeing nothing, seeing no other comments, um, we will move to uh, the... Um, Potential service modifications and budget implications. Um, Ms. Cindy Stiglich. Good afternoon, uh, Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, for the record, Cindy Stiglich, um, Interim Chief Financial Officer for HART. So during the joint meetings between the Operation and Safety Committee and the Finance and Audit Committee, um, the following presentation was given by Mr. Cochran, but there were several members who wanted to understand better the rationale, the recommendations uh, relative to the upcoming budget year. So I'm really just giving kind of a high-level context to this presentation um, as it pertains to the budget development for 21. 
Um, in February, we, as we normally do, we began to plan for FY21. At that time, we were trending to be between 5 and 7% over budget uh, by the end of FY20. That equated to about $5 million. Um, as we continued to trend those expenses and revenues even through May, even as we dealt with the COVID-19 conditions um, and those modified service levels, it was still apparent that uh, the expenses were going to trend over budget. Um, and actually, revenues were trending to be under budget by about $2.8 million, uh, primarily due to decreased fares resulting from the de decreased ridership. So as I was projecting the operating expenses and, and the revenues um, for the end of FY20, um, I was estimating about $7.8 million as an operating deficit that would have to be defrayed with our reserves. And I think it's, it's been no secret that our year-end reserves, cash reserves, have been um, declining over the last few years. And, and trying to, to um, absorb a $7.8 million deficit would put our cash reserves in a very dangerous low level and certainly would not sustain us into uh, the beginning of FY21. So looking forward to FY21, realizing that the expenses have historically outpaced our revenues by about 7%, um, it, we, I was also looking at ad addressing a, an additional projected deficit in FY21 of $8 million. Um, the board will, will get a first look um, at our budget in, in June, or excuse me, in July, on July 20th. Um, but Hello? I'm sorry. I, I lost your audio. I don't know if others did, uh, but I didn't hear it. For a couple minutes, I lost your audio there. Do you hear now? Hello? Yes, I hear you. I could hear you. But I, I can hear you now. For, it was out for about two minutes. Uh-oh. Okay, so uh, let me go back to, um, I, I kind of prefaced with projecting back from February that we would have at the end of FY20, an estimated $7.8 million operating deficit because of increased expenses and decreased revenues. So again, that would bring us to a very low level in our cash reserves, um, and it would not sustain us into even to the first few months of, of FY21. So again, the board will see the tentative budget in July. And what I plan to present at that time is that without a, a, a sustainable revenue source, we would be looking at, or potentially cutting expenses, we would be looking at another $8 million uh, potential deficit. So considering that the sales tax um, is probably not going to be part of that equation, we needed to consider ways of, of either increasing our revenues, decreasing our expenses, or employ a combination of both, you know, to mitigate that deficit. So unfortunately, in April, uh, we did receive notice of the CARES Act. Uh, that award is $39.9 million. Um, again, I will give a more in-depth um, understanding to the board in, in July of, of the ways in which that can be spent. But when um, when we do that, we want to make sure that we not only address the operating deficit that we'll realize in 20, but also look to defray any of those deficits in 21, uh, potentially restore some of our reserves to position us for, you know, those times when we are awaiting our revenue sources or sh revenue streams. And then, you know, potentially look at ways of, of approaching um, our capital improvement plan. But I think the main thing to, to walk away with, uh, uh, the understanding is, number one, the CARES Act is, um, it's not a check. It is a reimbursement grant. So as we incur the expenses, we will be able to get reimbursed from the FTA. And that will take us... Um, probably until the end of FY21, in order to get uh, to uh, in order to draw down, if you will, 
the entire $39.9 million. So that money is not sitting in the bank um, as we speak. And, and the CARES Act is really a short-term salvation. It is really not a long-term solution. So with that understanding, deficits, um, n knowing we need a sustainable revenue source or, or cutting our expenses in some way, service planning was challenged with looking at ways in which to modify service um, holistically and then concurrently with the network uh, evaluation that, that Mr. Cochran alluded to, the comprehensive, comprehensive operations analysis that's being con uh, conducted right now to provide the, the best service with our current resources. So the, the goal of the service modification plan that, that Mr. Cochran will present again to this committee is to consider our current budgetary constraints be fiscally responsible with our CARES revenue, and then balance that focus with the desire of the needs of the community um, to provide the most effective and efficient service possible. So that's kind of the, the, the precursor to his presentation and, and putting a little context um, to why we're bringing this to you for consideration. So with that, I'll take any questions or turn this over to, to uh, Mr. Cochran. Are there any questions? I'm sorry, I have to, I'm just going to say um, that I know that we privately went through, as I guess all board members did, kind of the budget. You know that I've been very aware of the budget, and I'm, I've been extremely worried um, that we didn't seem to be acknowledging our budget constraints as a board. Um, I'm one of the only uh, board members, few board members, that was here for Mission Max, and I was very dissatisfied with the way that Mission Max was put forward. Um, and, you know, at this time, with the CARES Act, I don't see where we should be making any cuts in service that is valuable and provides, um, uh, with the CARES Act, of almost $40 million, which our whole ad valorem budget last year was $44 million. So that we can draw on that, and we can draw on that very broadly, unlike other places. For instance, uh, the Stras can't use it to make up their attendance dollars, or neither none of the not-for-profits. But these transit dollars that were given, they were very explicitly given. I talked to Congresswoman Castor, who was very much um, uh, one who uh, promoted this for local communities. Um, were given broadly so that we can use them, and I know you'll talk about this more, but I'll just say I'm very um, uh, reluctant in any way to cut any essential service uh, that we do, and I consider frequency on these well-used routes to be essential service when we actually have this $39 million and we didn't know what was going to happen with our ad valorem, but it looks like right now our ad valorem uh, that we would be getting, it's not, it's not like the sales tax, the impacts for sales tax, but it's the property tax looks like we will have a um, robust showing. And so it looks like our, our, our shortfalls will come from revenue, um, which is a small part of the service and certainly could be um, made up with the $40 million. But with that, we can just move forward. I just wanted to express my budget concerns. Um, initially, I wasn't sure how this would come down. We didn't um, really know about the uh, CARES Act, I think, and some of it. And I, I will personally um, be very reluctant to do any frequency cuts at all. Um, and, um, and I am really want to know what the implications of any of these cuts are. I'm interested in the increases in service, and um, and I also don't know why we would possibly be doing RFPs for other things except for something approved like the downtown or, uh, downtown, or a downtown circulator done by heart, um, you know, if, if we have budget constraints. But well, I guess we can just go on to the services. This is turning into be a really long meeting, so I'm not, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Commissioner, I just wanted to, this is being put forth the committee for their consideration. Um, the, the budget that will be presented to the board in July will not contemplate 
the savings that are put forth in this presentation at this time. So you will see a budget in July that is based on our estimated expenses and revenues um, with the CARES Act, um, helping to balance that budget. Um, and, and this is, again, our way of looking at not just putting money to, a, to the service, but also making sure that the service that's being provided is the the um, the most efficient and effective service. So they they were they were parallel, um, you know, exercises here. So this right. will be for for um, your consideration, but not inclusion in the July uh, budget presentation. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we can move on to the. If there's no other questions, anybody else? Um, so we'll move on to the. Um, uh, public Director, outreach, the um, committee chair, uh, Mr. Con yes. Mm -hmm. Director Mechanic has his hand up, and so does Mayor Castor. Oh, okay. Director Mechanic. Um, yes, um, I, I just wanted to make a point, not to contradict any point that you just made, but uh, and Cindy may be able to comment on this, but the tax roll. The Avalor tax roll for this year would be unaffected by COVID because the values are determined as of January 1 of any given tax year. Mm -hmm. So we should expect, and I, I don't know what the numbers would be, but we should expect to see a reduction in the tax roll for 2021 because of the fact that I mean, we've seen businesses that just simply went out of business. We've seen businesses scale back. And so property values, at least the commercial properties, are probably going to be diminished. So we do have to forecast what reduced Avalorum revenues will look like for 2021 and, and 2022 um, as part of our overall forecasting here. I, I can comment on that if you'd sure. like, Commissioner. Okay. Sure, sure, so, sure. Um, we, we are not expecting um, any impact for our fiscal 21, so that would be October. We are still anticipating, in fact, I, I received the assessment values um, as of yesterday, and we will have a 9% increase, which is approximately $4 million. What we could, in, what we could find is that going into our fiscal 22, which would be October of 21, that yes, there could be an impact to the ad valorem. We've been in prop, uh, contact with property appraiser. They are not projecting yet. Uh, we anticipate that between now and the end of August, we'll have some projection as to what they think that might look like. Um, but yes, for 21, we'll, we're okay. What we don't know is what, what we'll expect in 22. Right. That that was the point I was making. It it looks the tax roll will look okay for this year and I'm talking tax year now, but in 2021 the values should uh, would be expected to go down which will affect our 2022 fiscal year. Mhm. Mm uh, right. Taken. Pardon. Sure. Director Harden. Yes. What, what, so, and reinforcing what Mr. Mechanic's saying is, you know, the uh, so with regards to looking at how we can spend this thirty-nine million dollars and what efficiencies we can find in the current uh, budget, including um, route systems and proportionate SG&A cuts, um, are is going to be important because now is the time that you're going to plan for that deficit, which you know is I would. I would more adamantly say reinforce what uh, Mr. Mechanic's saying is, is more than likely a tax rule that's more than likely to shrink, especially given um, the effect of this COVID uh, situation on commercial properties. And um, so, yeah, we need to be fiscally prudent. And now it really is the time to look at, you know, uh, you know, while we, while we do need to double down on routes, you know, like the, 15-minute frequency 
highly ridden routes. We need to look at the routes that are driving the average cost up to $6 because we're paying $13 to run empty buses to remote locations. I mean, to be blunt. So, you know, I, I think that you're on the right path and, uh, that, you know, the board probably is going to want to look at those things. And, um, so, you know, anyway, my input, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more comments? Yeah. I wouldn't disagree with you that we're all concerned about efficiency, ridership, keeping heart alive, um, and, you know, just uh, making sure that we um, can budget for outgoing years. And, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, good to be thinking about all those as we move forward. Um, I just didn't want to make – I personally am going to look closely at um, extreme cuts in highly used routes, uh, frequently used routes, and – if we can um, just, I guess, move to the presentation. Uh, committee Chair, Committee Member Overman has her hand up. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Committee Carter, Chair Overman. Um, Ms. Carter, and I, you know, to, re to reiterate um, Director Mechanic and Harden's comments, I think that was part of the reason why I asked earlier about making sure we get the MOUs done for, like, the streetcar project. I mean, I think projecting forward, we're obviously going to have tighter budgets as a consequence of the pullback that's going to occur in our economy. Um, but that's also why I need to make sure that we keep an equity perspective um, priority when it comes to looking at not only ROI on a route, but... Uh, ROI in the investment in a community so that, that they don't always run hand in hand but if we're planning for the future and recognizing that we're going to have to find other sources of money now's the time to build those partnerships so even though we may not need it this year we're going to need it in the year and a half from now and uh, now's the time to start laying that groundwork on those relationships so I appreciate this coming forward and, and knowing, you know, basically what we're, what our long-term plan looks like so that we can actually you, yeah. make sure the board is on board and advocating everywhere we possibly can for the dollars that we need to run this agency. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Any other comments? Okay. Hearing none, let's move to the uh, uh, heart proposed January 2021 service changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Kemp. Um, we can uh, start out here. The action uh, uh, requested that we are asking out of this is to ultimately authorize HART staff to conduct public outreach for the proposed January 21st service changes and advance this item to the full board of directors at the July 20, uh, 2020 regular board meeting. Um, next slide, please. Um, we'll quickly give you a background on um, um, on the plan, uh, the modifications uh, that we're proposing, uh, next steps, and we'll take some questions. So the background on this, um, the staff objectives, we were really looked at um, uh, taking a, um, a as uh, Ms. Stiglitz had, had um, um, said prior, taking a holistic view in order um, to really be not only f fiscally responsible in uh, consideration of our budgetary constraints, but balancing the focus with our desire to serve the needs of our community in a both a, an effective and efficient manner of, as possible. And in doing that, our objectives were really looking at um, identifying operational savings, preserving as much service coverage and frequency as possible, uh, maximizing our resources um, in productive corridors, and then maintaining COVID-19 uh, essential services that we were able to identify um, um, since, um, 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 since uh, that we've had to start this Sunday service in March. Um, and then um, also taking the opportunity to address many of the community and operational um, concerns and requests since the Mission Max that we can put back on the street and then ultimately listen to the needs and, uh, of the, the, the uh, customer and community. Next slide, please. 
some of the analyses that were considered, we looked at pre, pre COVID-19 uh, uh, ridership uh, through Feb, uh, from October through February, 2020 and identifying uh, the routes that carried the most riders. Um, um, this is an example of the top 10. Um, I, I think these are very uh, obviously reflective of the previous presentation um, and the um, uh, passages per revenue um, hours um, and as well as uh, uh, the, the highest ridership routes. Next slide. Um, in contrast, we also looked at the lowest um, rider, uh, lowest productive routes with the least amount of ridership as well. And then we also looked at um, the month of April, sort of in the heart of um, the COVID-19 data that we have currently um, that we can really use to understand um, what the ridership trends are um, that the pandemic has had, um, the, the, the impact that the uh, uh, pandemic has had on heart ridership and productivity. Um, so we are able to look at the ranking of the top 10, um, uh, next slide please, as well as the ranking of ridership and productivity of the bottom 10 um, as well. These are just examples. So we use that ridership to really help us identify um, what were consistencies um, pre-COVID, post-COVID, um, and helping us to identify what are essential services um, that we were able to identify that we could really focus um, and help hone our, our, our um, strategy in moving forward as, as a critical um, portion of this service plan. We also looked at cost per passenger um, by route. This is the same graph um, that you saw in the previous presentation. Um, if we can look at the uh, next slide, please. I'm sorry, next slide. And then one more. Apologize, I didn't uh, keep up with you there. Um, again, these are slides we saw in the uh, in the previous presentation. So these were again all an uh, analytics that we looked at in analyzing um, where the um, where the um, uh, effectiveness um, and efficiencies in our system were in going into where we could make cuts um, and where we might see dramatic um, cost cost effective changes um, and trying to identify where we could um, maintain coverage um, while having the least amount of impact on our customers. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our modifications plan fell into four primary categories. We had minor route adjustments, um, so, um, substantive uh, modifications, reduced frequencies, and then uh, um, actual removal of service uh, recommendations. And I'll go through each one of these. Next slide, please. So if we begin with our adjusted and added services, um, the route 5, 7, 8, uh, 10, 14, 42, 45, and 48. Um, these are all ones that we looked at making um, some modifications to. Um, um, and, and I'll go through each one of these. Next slide, please. Um, on the Route 5 and 48, um, we're, we're um, proposing to move Route 5 back through uh, U the USF campus. This is something that we've heard a lot of feedback on. Um, it will provide um, a great deal of access for um, um, being that the Bull Runner does not allow the public to ride on it. It provides uh, public access to the public university where many people do work. Um, um, to be able to, to get to their jobs um, um, and, and be able to run that back through, uh, through campus. The Route 48 um, um, and will uh, also serve the USF campus on Holly Drive and extend to serve areas uh, north on uh, Fletcher Avenue. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Route 7, uh, we're looking at... Um, uh, moving to serve uh, Main Street from North Boulevard, uh, move it over to Howard and Armenia. And this really uh, focuses on serving future West River uh, redevelopment um, and um, really um, move um, 
away from the North Boulevard ridership in that segment between Martin Luther King and the, and the downtown area, which is relatively low. Um, we anticipate a great deal of improvement um, on of ridership in that area. And it will also provide access on Main Street um, to a great deal of affordable housing and um, uh, mixed housing uh, development that should be coming online in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, added in uh, uh, more services on the Route 8. Uh, the Route 8 will serve 4th Street instead of 7th Avenue. Um, I, a, a comment that came up uh, last meeting um, was in regards to duplication of the streetcar service. Um, and looking at this further, um, this new modification um, actually reduces the amount of uh, duplication um, to the streetcar and that it turns, it would turn on Kennedy um, and serve Kennedy and Jackson um, 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 and up to Marion. <clears throat> Next uh, slide, please. For the Route 10, um, the new Route 10 would, uh, would replace the uh, Route 60 and 75 between MTC and the airport. Um, this would provide service on Cypress Avenue, uh, which has been something that has been um, 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 supported um, from you all um, as the board in, in, in providing guidance as something that um, we all, I think we, there was a, a, a deep consensus among staff, uh, the board uh, as well, that, that this would be a, a good move to, um, to serve future Midtown development and all of the new development on Cypress Avenue um, and continue connectivity to some of the social services um, on the uh, west side as well. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Route 42 and Route 45, uh, right now the Route 42 and 45 meet at Yukon and, and are interlined. Our uh, proposal would be to um, just make the Route 42 a circular um, up north um, <clears throat> in the um, um, up north um, that would not come down to the Yukon area and just simply have the Route 45 run from UATC all the way down um, to the West Shore area. Um, so that would provide a one, a one seat ride um, and be much more efficient. It would no longer serve Yukon, um, but it would be a much more efficient ride and we would anticipate um, improved uh, ridership on that as well. <clears throat> And our modifications for reduced frequency, um, we have identified um, a, a, the potential recommendation for reducing frequency of our 15 minute routes for the one, the six, um, the 34 and the 400 from 15 minutes to 20 minutes. And then reducing frequency for the 33 and the 46 from 30 minutes to 60 minutes and then reducing the number of trips from five to three in both the AM and PM for the 20 LX. Um, now, I do wanna make a comment on this slide um, in, in, um, in recognition of um, concerns that were made at the last meeting. This, this in no way reflects Hart's desire of our previous or future service level goals. We maintain service level goals um, that are stated in the TDP to be um, at 15 minute frequency to create a high frequency network. However, this is, this is um, the result of the extenuating circumstances um, that were spoken of um, by Ms. Stiglitz um, in the beginning. So I, I do want to pre sort of preface this, um, the, the proposal of these um, reduced frequencies um, looking at moving from 15 minute to 20 minute frequency, we can reduce a large chunk of money by only reducing five minutes of frequency for, for, for people. Rec understanding and recognizing these are important corridors um, without having as seemingly dramatic an impact as going from 30 minute to 60 minute on some of the other routes. Um, but again, that a lot of this um, are, is all about going out to the public and getting feedback on it and being able to present it to you all um, to get feedback as well. So um, 
removal of services um, as part of this modification plan. Um, this is a whole list you see. Um, we, we recognize that the express routes are, are, are not, um, our express routes are, are not um, effective um, um, uh, services at this point in time. And the majority of those, we have significant um, service um, removal recommendations or at least being able to merge them into other routes to make to make them more cost effective, uh, 275, um, ending it at UATC um, and replacing the lower portion of it between the airport and MTC with uh, the Route 10, um, just for example. Um, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So I'll quickly go through this uh, Route 25 and 60 LX. Um, right now, the, the 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 map that you see on the right is actually the existing service. Um, we would look to to we haven't completely had the opportunity to go through and make the um, decision on how we would reroute the 360 to best cover what was lost with the route. 60 if we were to in fact uh, um, take that out and still be able to um, pick up some of the ridership in that and that is something that we are expecting to um, be able to uh, help come out of the uh, network evaluation in the very near future. Next slide please. <clears throat> The Route 35, this will essentially go back to pre-mission max where the uh, Route 35 will be uh, merged into the Route 30 and the Route 30 will run all the way from Northwest Transit Center to MTC through the airport, Social Security, um, down Kennedy Boulevard, um, the same way it did uh, before mission max. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Route 275 LX, um, as mentioned, we would propose that that ends at UATC as that um, has uh, actually 54% of the ridership occurs between uh, Wiregrass and UATC. Um, downtown to UATC on uh, 275 is 31% of the ridership and downtown to TIA um, is about 15% of the total ridership. Um, so they're, they're, we are seeking to maintain the vast majority of the access for ridership uh, between the Wiregrass and UATC on that. Next slide, please. Um, the, the Hart uh, Flex North, uh, Northdale, we would look to remove the Flex uh, service up in there and make it a, just a straight fixed route service. We have, a, uh, enough, um, we have enough slack time that we were able to run that all the way up and do a circle around um, um, the um, St. Joseph's area up there, not actually going into the hospital. Um, that is Calusa Trace Boulevard, I believe, up there, that that would run um, around Van Dyke, Calusa Trace Boulevard, and back down uh, Dale Mabry to uh, Fletcher Avenue. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so with all that, this is a, our modifications plan. Um, what you see on this map, the colors are the important um, thing on here. Um, you will see the 20 minute frequency in green, 30 minute in blue, 60 minute in purple, and we still have some de determined to be determined in the, the orange uh, um, routes. Um, we are, are, are continuing to get, um, data is continuing to, to come online from our uh, network evaluation. Uh, we are doing our best to be able to incorporate that as quickly as possible. Um, and um, from, we have had um, um, a few conversations with them. Um, early recommendations that are coming out of the network evaluation are, are very much in line with what we are proposing at this point in time. So we, there is um, a lot of agreement that is coming out between um, what, what um, we have been able to recommend um, in, in the near term here and, and what is coming out of the COA. Um, but there will be a lot more detail to come out of the COA in the near future. Um, ultimately, this reduced the peak uh, vehicles to 115 with a total reduction of an estimated 60, a little over 66,000 annual vehicle miles. That's about, uh, uh, excuse me, vehicle hours. Uh, that's about 10% of the vehicle hour services uh, with the annuals, um, estimated annual savings of $4.3 million. 
Um, we would project that our, our estimate, being that we are looking to put this into service in the uh, second quarter next year, our projected savings would only be for three quarters next year. For So that would be about $3.2 million. Um, and about $2 million annually would be directly related to uh, operator savings and overtime um, and being able to adjust operator savings at this moment in time um, there is no plan for um, any um, change in the level of FTEs um, ultimately the highlights of this plan um, increasing the coverage um, in um, some of the uh, primary routes here excuse me uh, some of these routes uh, Cyprus uh, on Route 10 uh, Main Street, West Tampa, the Route 7, and North Florida Bears, uh, Route 48, um, which up there, sort of the circular, uh, in that area around uh, the Walmart, north of um, Fletcher, uh, Bears, um, um, Nebraska, Florida area. That has been a, a, a lot of feedback from people post-Mission Max, so we would be very happy to be able to bring service back to that area. And we know the customers would be very uh, pleased to have that back as well. Um, and then you can see um, the, the second bullet point highlights um, the rat, the um, gives you the eliminated routes in the uh, parentheses is the total number of stops impacted. Um, and there's really a, a, a relatively um, low number of boardings um, associated with those that are um, impacted as well. Um, and most of the impacted stops uh, will still be served um, um, and have other fixed route services within um, a quarter mile, um, which um, um, we consider um, um, accessible by walkability. Uh, next slide, please. This is a uh, current schedule that we have. We are in June presenting to uh, the committees. Um, and we would be taking, um, asking for your per, um, um, approval to be able to put this before the board and get approval on July 20th to start public outreach, uh, develop, uh, finish developing the plan, um, and, and run that through the end of September, um, have a public hearing in October. Um, present our findings to the November board and then we would that would give us time to be able to do all the bidding and um, um, be able to have the service on the street in uh, early January and then our next steps are to continue to incorporate the recommendations from the comprehensive operations analysis um, this will continue through late June and, and, and likely even beyond that um, create multiple options for service modifications based on feedback from um, um, from the COA um, and um, uh, the board and, and the public as well um, looking um, at looking um, at, at in reach and, and getting incorporating feedback from um, operate ongoing feedback from operations uh, modifying the plan based on um, um, uh, committee and board direction um, and then of course um, 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 probably the most um, equally important, if uh, not the most important, um, really getting out there and doing a very comprehensive uh, public outreach campaign um, um, and, and getting feedback from, uh, from the public and, and, and getting this all wrapped up to be able to put on the street in January. Uh, next slide. So ultimately, our... Um, we are asked, again, um, the action here is to authorize um, the staff to conduct a public outreach and for proposed um, January 2021 service changes and advance this item to the full board of directors at the end of July 20, um, excuse me, at the July 20th, 2020 regular board meeting. And with that, um, thank you for your time. Take you any questions or comments. Committee member Overman has her hand raised. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And uh, Commissioner Overman, you're recognized. Sorry about that. I forgot to take it down. My apologies. Oh, okay. Is there anyone else who has questions or comments that they'd like to make about this at this time? Uh, Mayor Castor's hand is still up. I think Mayor Castor is um, not at present any longer. Um, is there anyone else? No, ma'am. Okay. 
Okay, great. And seeing none, do we, um, and I appreciate the presentation being made. I think it was really important to get more of a um, context in terms of what we're suggesting that was uh, not done during Mission Max. I was very concerned about how this was um, moving forward and felt it needed um, greater um, vetting and, and uh a look at it. So I was glad to have that and glad to have the fiscal aspect of it. Um, and seeing none, is there a motion to move this forward? Uh, motion to move this uh, to authorize staff to initiate public outreach and to uh, move this to the full board for discussion. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second that, but I do have a question. So. Sure. Go ahead, Commissioner Arverman. Um Chris, how do you plan on doing public outreach given the circumstances of COVID and gathering that information, gathering people, gathering so, comments? Um, let me uh, quickly, uh, I can answer that, but if uh, uh, Ms. Haldo is online, then she can probably answer that best. <laughs> I am on the I am on the line. Um, so we are looking at our traditional plan, obviously, um, for that has been used by heart. Um, but we are looking to utilize some technology platforms that are out there. But we would have to say that we really believe that getting to transit centers and stops in a way that is socially responsible from a distancing perspective is going to have a lot of value here. So, Chris, I believe it is hilarious, correct? Chris? I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed that last part, if Jackie. Someone needs to mute, mute their... Okay. Yeah. Chris, it is the Laren group who is helping us with the social, uh, the technology platforms for outreach? Yeah, correct. So we are, yeah. um, there will be a, a significant, um, there will be a significant um, um, portion of this will be reliant upon technology. Um, and we are, um, um, with, with the full expectation of us understanding that, um, you know, we need to be, aware of technology limitations and perhaps getting to some communities. Um, and uh, we are, uh, you know, that's part of, that will, that will be part of the plan and how we address that. Those are things that we have, that I know we have already begun to discuss with the, um, with the outreach uh, contractor um, and, um, and also looking at other best practices that other, have you know, the meeting. Uh, there's a lot of agencies that are in this situation right now. So, um, and, um, you know, we, we will be sure to be able to, to cover all our bases on that. Uh, this is Jackie Holdo again from Communications. Uh, Commissioner Overman, I think really top of mind for us is technolo um, town hall technologies that we can use and platforms because one of the things that we want to be really mindful of is the consistency in our message when we're hitting those equity points, right, to make sure that we're sharing the same information over and over. So we'll be working through that. But we are giving a lot of thought, our outreach team, about what are safe ways that we can be out at transit centers and stops and potentially on routes um, sharing information uh, because that contact with the riders who really need to ride that you spoke of earlier is so, so very important in this. Great, thank you very much. And I just, I mean, we probably need to take a vote so we don't lose our quorum if we have right. ready. And I'll just be, thank you for bringing it up, Commissioner Overman. Did Valerian do the outreach before in for Mission Max? Uh, we did determine no, ma'am, they did not. Okay, good. Uh, it was really, um, that, and that was not during coronavirus, but I really, really appreciate that question. I think it's really important that we have, you know, printed copies of uh, something that we can hand to people where they can call in or, or uh, you know, send an email or do whatever at whatever time and really clear notification and that we're passing it out 
to the riders at the uh, centers, you know, as they board the buses or um, at the stops or wherever and however. I know that that's not optimum right now, but I do think it's really important, and I really appreciate the question. Having said that, let's uh, call the question, because I don't know if we have a quorum anymore, but um, we have a motion uh, by um, Director Mechanic, seconded by Commissioner Overman. Um, all those, uh, the staff would record the vote, please. Yes, committee chair, for clarification, um, it was Hardin who made the motion, seconded by um, oh, committee I'm sorry. member Overman. Excuse me. Not a problem. Please <laughs> yes. say yes or no after your name is called. Committee Chair Kemp? Yes. Director Hardin? Yes. Director Castor? Director Mechanic? Yes. Director Overman? Yes. The motion passes well, we do have a four problem. to zero. Okay. Having uh, done that, I think we are ready to, um, I don't think we, is there anybody with old business or new business at this time? Uh, hearing none, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Adam Harden. Has left the meeting. Thank you.